So for this second session uh, of this workshop, we will focus on more technical topics on radio and sensing for 6G, as you can see uh, in the presentation here. And the first presentation is from HexX on vision gaps and action towards 6G radios by Arno Persinen. Thank you, Patrick and Nico. Are my slides now really visible for you? Yes, we can see and see and hear you. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, yes, my name is Arno Persinen and I'm working at the University of Oulu and I'm co-leading Work Package 2 in Hexa X and we are speaking about the radios and their uh, different aspects towards 6G. So I would like to acknowledge all our Work package leaders and all our other, all uh, our task leaders and all of the work package to contributors for these results. So these are in essence from our two first deliverables that have been published, and I have the links at the end of the presentation for you use. So the <coughs> outline today is that I will be discussing about the different activities we have been pursuing in the project uh, in work package two that has been targeting towards seemingly infinite capacity and data rates. So of course, that will be somehow finite, but uh, but how far we can go, and, and that will be the topic in this discussion. And uh, we are, of course, need to look at different KPIs, KVIs, and, and so forth. But then we have organized uh, some key items related to have a good match of, of different things there. and. Uh, we try to look at the uh, radio aspects holistically for the really high speed radios. That has been our main emphasis. Some other smaller activities maybe, but this is the main joint focus and, and looking at them from the radio channel point of view, waveform and modulation, enabling hardware technologies, beamforming and distributed MIMO. And these are the necessary elements uh, to be to be handled in this context and uh, we have tried to figure out a balanced way of getting the information from one to another and, and trying to formulate a, formulate something that we can utilize in, in more deeper uh, analysis of different properties during the rest of the project. Today I'm mostly talking about uh, modeling and what is the status at the moment. Uh, our focus is mostly in the frequency ranges of 100 to 300 gigahertz, but of course the concepts in general can be can be viewed in, in broader sense. Uh, a bit of the classification of the millimeter wave technologies for communications and sensing functions. And uh, as we as I said, we are speaking about high performance 6G millimeter wave technology opportunities that cannot be fully exploited yet using the existing 5G new radio or even advanced versions of that. So looking looking a bit beyond of that. And uh, there are of course short range wireless links, small cells less than 100 meter, uh, low mobility cases with a wireless access device to infrastructure or device to device kind of uh, use scenarios uh, with extremely high data bits. Uh, rates. Then long range wireless links, front, mid and backhaul, fixed wireless links, including also the mobile wireless links that might be one of the most attractive use cases in the future. And then adding this sensing with radio waves, so not meaning directly sensor networks, but localization, mapping, tracking, spectroscopy and so forth. We have been working in that together with the work package three that will have their presentation just after myself. So much of that uh, content is there and uh, we have been trying to trying to support them then with the topics we are handling and trying to find the coexist opportunities with the communications. Uh, then to get some sort of a starting point for the analysis, we have defined uh, two kind of scenarios 
before we are having very detailed use cases defining what kind of bit rates will be needed. So uh, making sure that we have something tangible to get started with. And the first wave 6G radio requirements, we are talking about 100 gigabit per second, 100 to 2 gigahertz range. Uh, radio link coverage 100 to 200 meters, making an assumption of the time division du duplexing and uh, looking at the device to infrastructure or mobile and back backhaul front hall properties of these targets. And uh, then we are having a bit longer term vision with the one terabit per second, uh, looking also what can happen and what how we should be treating frequencies roughly up to 300 gigahertz and a bit shorter link ranges for that. Of course, this is not an exclusive set of potential use cases for the 6G, but uh, something that we consider kind of as a major extremes that we can then utilize in the, in the following following uh, phases as well. And uh, modeling of very different disciplines, different properties together from the hardware to the uh, radio link and, uh, and waveforms requires abstractions and it requires some initial parameters to get the analysis ongoing also in practical sense. And, uh, one of them is that if we would like to target for the 100 gigabit per second is that how much signal bandwidth we will be actually needing. And, and if we assume a bit of a coding and different modulations, we are ending up of the need for uh, 20 to 120 gigahertz bandwidth. And we can easily see that this bandwidth is actually uh, close to the 5G new, carry, new radio carrier frequencies at FR2, so in lower millimeter wave range. So uh, really something that, that uh, uh, need to be looked uh, beyond what we, can, what we can see today. And, and uh, of course there is link feasibility, RF performance, waveforms, radio channel, how they can interact together to make this feasible. Channel spectrum availability is of course of interest for us. It has been in other work packages more in detail what is the spectrum regulation, but of course, we are demanding quite a lot and how to channelize that uh, over different opportunities, including frequency and uh, possible uh, MIMO channels and so forth. One thing we need to remember that as we are targeting for high data rates, meaning higher bandwidths, there is inherently larger noise over that bandwidth. So there is fundamental physical limit of the link range that is, is hard to circumvent. And then we are having additional constraints that we are discussing here and also opportunities. And this performance modeling with technology constraints is, is kind of a, one of the key items to see what enabling technologies we may have, what enabling technologies we will be needing in the future and what kind of challenges we need to face towards the 6G radio systems from that aspect. Uh, semiconductor technologies is definitely one of the areas where there are uh, coming bounds in a such a way that we need to rethink quite a lot. We already understand in millimeter wave that things are changing, but even further so we see that the PA output power and LNA noise figure set limits for the link ranges. And uh, both of them are highly frequency dependent. So high, as we are going to the higher frequencies, output power is reduced noise figure is increased just by the fundamental properties of different semiconductors. And uh, we, of course, mostly uh, would like to use silicon-based uh, technologies, but uh, if we are looking at the requirements, we need to also look at quite carefully the opportunities in three to five semiconductors as they can perform at higher frequencies better. But on the other hand, they are also uh, maybe not mature enough as technologies and uh, therefore quite many things in the technology uh, perspective needs to be looked very carefully from different aspects and maybe not copying the ideas from the previous generations even with the millimeter wave 5G approaches. Uh, 
And there are, of course, other non-idealities uh, we have been covered, but not discussed too much in this presentation. Uh, analog to di digital converters, uh, dynamic range is reducing, power goes up. This is some topic that has been discussed in uh, several presentations. For example, Gerard Fettweiss has been discussed this in some occasions earlier, and, and those are extremely important. And, and uh, those are also the aspects that the Cornet uh, that is presenting also in this workshop is, is providing deeper insights and complementing what we are doing here. Uh, then one, of course, easy proposal is that can we compensate all that with the extremely large arrays? And there we are facing practical constraints as well. So the area of the antennas versus electronics is changing. So even integrated circuits might become big compared to the antennas. Easily, we are ending up the scenarios in, in classical uh, phased array concept, which is highly flexible there, where we are having thousands or tens of thousands antennas and, and from implementation feasibility point of view, that requires also new approaches. So there is a lot of these sort of things where we need to think about radio system parameters, electronics, antennas, form factor, everything together very carefully to find the right uh, parameters and, and uh, aspects. Uh, candidate waveforms is actually uh, related a lot also to the uh, physical implementation and the radio channel we are facing. And uh, we know that uh, uh, OFDM that is used in 5G new radio is having high peak to power ratio. And uh, that means that actually we cannot utilize the output power as a full for the modulation, but we need to back off it quite a bit. And this is, of course, as, we, as I anticipated in previous slides, that our output power is also getting reduced. It is something that we should be taking very seriously. So we are targeting of looking at new waveforms and uh, with a high power efficiency, meaning low peak to average power ratio, high robustness to hardware impairments, and also low implementation complexity, because we need also know that, that the digital signal processing takes a lot of power when the data rates are going higher and higher. And uh, there is a larger set of waveforms that has been discussed. Here are just a few examples on the early first results, but uh, there is uh, in, in our earlier deliverable also created many more waveforms than shown here against different KPIs we anticipate to be important for the waveforms. Uh, here we are having a two examples. The one in the lower left corner is, is comparing different waveforms at 120 gigahertz against uh, phase noise. And we see that there is uh, actually uh, compared to the cyclic prefix OFDM, some waveforms that are much more robust to the phase noise. That seems to be one of the important things here uh, for getting the high bit rates with the decent, uh, uh, decent uh, signal to noise ratio. Uh, then in the right side, we are comparing actually the throughput and uh, uh, in a way, range difference that is being described as a relative maximum coupling loss between two modulations and see that when we are having a nonlinear PA model, in this case, we have been using 60 gigahertz PA from, from uh, uh, 3GPP. Uh, we can see that there is a significant increase in, in the ratio, so we can actually, with the other modulations, get the same throughput with a better link budget true. And that is really giving further motivation to look at these waveforms and, and RF non-idealities and channel more and more carefully to make sure that we are having the right waveform in the limited link range available. Uh, beamforming is something that we have been, of course, needed already in the lower millimeter wave range in uh, at higher frequencies due to the number of antennas, due to the other antenna constraints, form factor constraints. 
we need to look at this even more carefully against hardware implementations and KPIs. So uh, fully digital is not necessarily the right way of going, but there are low resolution ADCs being studied as well. So there is one path, the other one is sub arrays and, and otherwise other options as well. And we need to look at the beam width that is very narrow, steerability, latency, mobility, processing complexity and so forth. So we see that how complex trade off this is between different aspects from hardware to the algorithms. And uh, there has been a system modeling approach uh, signal model for link level simulations, evaluation of the theoretical limits, taking different design constraints into account in this context, and also modeling the waveform against it. So trying to get things into the same package built up nicely. Uh, finally, uh, distributed MIMO is, is looked at what is beyond 5G systems currently. So enabling techniques for scalable distributed large antenna systems for converged access back hole, front hole, and uh, looking at network capacity aspects, in this case also below 100 gigahertz, but also above 100 gigahertz. And uh, evaluating realistic deployment options, hardware impairments, traffic models, scalability limitations, and so forth. And distributed MIMO is, of course, attractive because it can help in unreliable links against blockage and link range limitations due to the path loss, uh, providing lower, po lower power consumption in, in access points or local base stations, and also lower transmitted powers compared to the other solutions. So there is quite some interest on that. And finally, uh, of course, uh, everything starts in a way on the properties of the radio channel. And uh, in addition to the line of sight, uh, uh, we know that there is quite a lot of transmission losses in, in different uh, areas and trying to evaluate that how differently we need to address radio channels above 100 gigahertz compared to what we are seeing below at the moment. And uh, we have been doing measurements uh, for the materials, seeing that some materials are very insensitive to the frequency, while in some cases there is actually very radical losses uh, over the frequency range. So seeing that uh, the radio environment from that perspective is, is changing quite a lot. There has been also indoor and outdoor directional channel sounding uh in at 140 gigahertz and we are using this measured database also to evaluate availability of the radio channels and uh, there has been a recent study published how many independent beams does the sub terahertz channel support actually which is very important so uh, how many of those uh, paths that are potentially there are available and usable and uh, there has been power angular density delay profile measurements. Based on those, as a result, we have seen that getting a channel true, there is in many of the cases only one beam available, up to 40 percentage of cases, uh, two for about 25 percentage of the cases, three for about 20, and four and more about 40 percentage of cases. These are with somewhat limited dynamic range, so from 0 to 20 uh, decibels within that range, we must remember that if the link range actually with the, in addition to the loss, or well, it's already limited by the loss, it's very difficult to tolerate even 10 dB more losses. So from hardware point of view and from implementation point of view, how many of these available beams are even usable needs to be addressed very, very carefully. But uh, the question is that are the other beam directions available if the loss path is blocked? Is spatial multiplexing a viable option? And for about the 60 percentage of cases, there is some opportunities on those, maybe not at that extent that we are experiencing at uh, sub six gigahertz frequencies, but still something to be considered seriously. So as a conclusion, uh, 
we need a deep understanding of all elements of radio design from physics to system concepts for ultra high performance 6G radios. And we are trying to make a balanced view towards enabling technologies and their trade-offs. Uh, we are continuing now enhancing and merging models towards the 6G radio concept in, in radio link level specifically and towards distributed MIMO. There will be in the next EUC and C uh, some small demonstration available for the selected features. And we have already done two deliverables that are publicly available in, in HexAX pages. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Arno, uh, we have a question on the chat. So on slide eight, uh, which PN model is used in this evaluation slide? 3D PP model or Gaussian PN model? Uh, if I'm right, uh, it's a 3G PP model at the moment, but we uh, acknowledge that we should be looking at in the broader sense and the PN modeling at higher frequencies from different aspects for different technologies are needed to complement this analysis. Thank you. There was another question here, also answered in chat, but as only bands above 100 gigahertz are considered, does this mean that from HexX perspective, 6G air interface for bands below 100 gigahertz will be based on N or 5G advanced? Uh, evolution. I wouldn't say exactly so, but uh, I, I think that, that in HexX we are having a very many different items that are going to impact also the other uh, frequency ranges, let's say below 100 gigahertz. However, in, in this study, we saw that especially in these ultra high speed radios, there was a conscious choice now to focus this as the newest feature that requires most of the work at this phase. But definitely not ignoring further developments in, in, in 5G new radio as well. Although, for example, I think, for example, waveforms are pretty much agreed there already, and, and uh, 5G Advance is working on, towards those further. So we try to make a one step forward on that. Thank you. There were another question. Why is the focus on TDD? Uh, kind of keeping in the initial phase uh, concept uh, bit easier from the interference point of view when FDD and uh, if we are even speaking about the full duplex with this complexity, I, I think that those need to be then evaluated once we get the basic basic features ready. So we see quite some benefits. The other reason is that we see also trend in the millimeter waves that, that many of these things are moving towards the TDD. Uh, operational bands. Thank you. And then final question. Uh, in the state of the art, some schemes are proposed to address the energy efficiency and RF robustness requirements. Will HexX consider the recently designed sub terahertz waveforms or modulation in the comparison? Uh, I hope. Uh, I think this is something we need to be discussed more in detail in the next step and towards the ne next deliverables then with the team. Thank you, Arno. Thank so you very you much. Have, if you have any further questions, you can ask them in the chat and Arno can respond there. Uh, moving on with the agenda, the next presentation is on from also from HexX on localization and sensing use cases and gap analysis by Ali Bevravan from Ericsson. Yes, thank you, Patrick. Hi, everyone. Uh, can you see my slide and also can you hear me well? Yes, you can go to presentation mode. OK, thank you. Yes, so yes. Um, my name is Ali Beravan and I'm today I'm uh, representing Work Package 3 since uh, Hank, who's uh, leading this work package, could not attend, unfortunately. Uh, and uh, I'll be presenting the work that we've done so far on the localization and sensing use cases and gap analysis. So um, first of all, the goal of this work package three, which is uh, twofold. One is that we want to explore the basically the potential of these technological advances that we made in communication and how we can use that for sensing and localization. Uh, second thing is that we want to see 
how we can use this uh, uh, information that we get regarding the uh, position of a device and also the environment, how we can use that in order to to do basically to do a better job in the communication, whether it's for beam forming and for like pilot uh, overhead reduction and such. Um, the goal of this first deliverable, which I'll be, which is the focus of the today uh, presentation, is more on the gap analysis and what we what we expect for the 6G. What what are the requirements that we want for 6G, and also what is possible to do in 5G, and then finding the gap, and hopefully the next step would be how to close that gap. And then, basically everything that we say about uh, the technologies that are available in communication this is uh, for 6G, this will be based on the um, basically technologies that will be developed by, by World Package 2. And uh, you saw the presentation just before this. So we'll, we'll, those are the assumptions that we have in the uh, 6G radio access. The outline of uh, this talk is that uh, we first discuss the fundamentals, what are the sensing and what are localization, and uh, then we talk about uh, the use cases and requirements. Uh, then to, in order to go to the gap analysis, we need to first establish the baseline. What are the uh, require, what are the basically um, achievable accuracies and resolutions that we can do by using 5G? Um, and then, yeah, we will we, we'll go to the gap analysis. Uh, then we will have a discussion on models and solutions for localization and sensing and uh, services that can be in, basically enabled by localization and sensing. Um, so first, fundamentals. Uh, this may be, I, I don't think that we need to spend too much time on this. This is basically what we mean by localization, and the idea here is that we want to localize a device that is an active device, active communication device, and we want to locate the, the location of this. Uh, there are these uh, well-known uh, technologies, the, the time difference of arrival, uh, also the angle of arrival, or it could be a combination of those. Also, it could be that the uh, the, the the RTT-based methods, but uh, we, we will go through those in a bit more detail in some later slides. And then sensing, which is a bit new in, in this discussion, is that uh, uh, basically the idea is that you want to locate the location of an object, uh, the speed of it, the angle of it and everything, and this object is not necessarily capable of doing any communication. So in, in the first uh, scenario, you have a monostatic sensing, and that is that you have a device that is capable of communication. You send a, sig a wave towards this object, and then the, the backscatter, based on the backscattered wave, you want to tell what is the, lock, what's the distance, what is the, the speed, and, and this type of information. Then you could be uh, to, uh, looking into another scenario, which is bi-static sensing, and in this case, the uh, transmission is sent from one point, and then the basically the backscatter signal is received at another point, and then based on this setup, you want to tell where the location is and what the speed is. Um, Use case and requirements. Uh, what we did in this part was that we we actually looked at the this use case families that uh, was presented earlier today before lunch, uh, and then we had these six uh, six G use case families, which are sustainable development, massive twinning, telepresence, robots to cobots, and local trust zones. What we did was that we went through these use case families and detailed some of the used common use cases under those and then we looked at what are the um, the required uh, sensing and localization for each of those uh, use cases i have a long list of use cases and maybe I, I don't think that there's time to go through all of them but then we can take one or two as just as examples here if we take for example uh, sustainable development, and we have one use case under that, which is uh, 
uh, e, e health for all. One of the uh, requirements here was that we want to be able to uh, basically uh, do drone deployment. We, um, the, the example we have was that uh, we want to do, uh, we want to collect samples from patients, for example, do using a drone. And then we we looked at what are the these basically the required uh, the requirements for each of these KPIs. So uh, for this, you want a location accuracy of decimeter level. So in this case, we said 0.1 meter to half a meter horizontal and uh, 0.1 to 0.3 vertical. You, orientation accuracy in this case doesn't matter. Uh, you want an update rate of at least once per second, and you want availability of uh, four nines in this case. And uh, in hopefully you don't need uh, to scale this. this we, we do not imagine that we, we need to have actually 100 uh, drones that are that we are serving at the same time. So it's not uh, it's not a requirement for this use case. Uh, one thing to note about this is that, first of all, these numbers, they are not uh, uh, hard science, really. It's, uh, it's the whole purpose of this is that we, we get some relative feeling regarding different use cases with respect to one another. And also when we compare this to, to what is achievable to do with using 5G. And then another thing is that the KPIs can be different for different use cases. In some use cases, you have, for example, uh, I don't know, velocity accuracy, while in this case, uh, I mean, picking up samples from a patient, you hopefully the patient is not moving. Uh, otherwise, you have bigger problems to deal with. Uh, then you can see that actually we have this for different use cases. Uh, and here, for example, for the gesture recognition, then we have, uh, of course, much tighter uh, requirements and also different type of requirements. We, now we need angular resolution as well and things like that, velocity range and so on. Uh, I have a table that in the end, actually, we, we, we make a comparison of all this. So maybe we don't have to go through all of this one by one. Um, this was... Uh, um, yeah, th those those were the, the the use cases and the relevant KPIs and the requirements. Now, uh, like I said, we want to find the gap between wh what 5G is capable of and basically what we saw that uh, we want to have this type of requirement. So first thing is to do a baseline evaluation. What is what can we do with 5G? Regarding localization, with the existing 5G, and we consider the downlink uh, NR positioning reference signal, we can see that uh, in this simulation we have uh, we have simulated for different uh, environment, which is urban macro, urban micro, and indoor open office. And here I only have the plot for the indoor open office. But if you look at this, then we have uh, for the multi-RTT, uh, measurement based on multi-RTT, time difference of arrival, uh, downlink time difference of arrival, and uplink time difference of arrival. And then if you focus for the just the indoor open office, if you look at the numbers here, uh, for example, in, in case of, and to be realistic, we have the unsync scenario. And then for downlink TDOA in FR1, you get 11 meters roughly, uh, for FR2, 12 meters roughly. Then uh, for uplink TDOA, again 11 and 11, something like that. And then for RTT based is one meter. Uh, if you remember the numbers that we showed for the 6G uh, requirements, th there were cases that we actually require much, much lower, uh, uh, yeah, lower accuracy. So. There seems to be a big gap regarding the localization. If we look at the sensing, and here we looked at the radar and lidar. For 
radar, uh, what we can do with the existing technology is that you can do uh, angular resolution of one degree azimuth and two degrees elevation, uh, field of view of 100 degrees azimuth, 30 degree elevation, range resolution of half a meter and range of 300 meters with velocity resolution of 0 0.1 meter. And with LIDAR, we don't have to go through all the numbers, but generally you get better numbers in terms of accuracy because with LIDAR you can do obviously better job uh, on that. Um, but when it comes, and by the way, we have we have a long list of uh, basically this uh, baselines for based on the existing technology that I just uh, picked some samples for this presentation. Now, what about the gap between what we can do in 5G and the expected 6G? Uh, now I stacked up all those uh, use cases that uh, I had in, in the previous slides, and then here we are looking at the accuracy requirement. Um, so for accuracy uh, for the for this uh, uh, remote healthcare, we said that the requirement is 0 0.1 meter to half a meter. And if we look at the if we compare this to what we just showed for the 5G, which is in terms of if, like uh, it could be a couple of meters, then this requirement is quite stringent. So everywhere you see on this column stringent or anything that is not relaxed, it means that we have to do something to basically achieve those. So, for example, in case of remote sensing and monitoring, if, if you have to remote, if you have to sense an area and just see if there are any big scale things are happening there, then your requirement is uh, you can address those with 5G. So if those are relaxed and then you, there are cases that you actually need millimeter millimeter level positioning which is very stringent so generally you can see that there are a couple there are quite a few cases that we cannot address with the existing 5g and this was just for the localization accuracy if we look at the um the latency then we see that for most of these we we actually need sub second accuracy and then that means that we cannot address those with the existing 5G uh, requirements. Um, yes, so regarding the availability, then uh, we, we anything that is above 90%, we assume that it's, it's not possible to do with the existing 5G. And then that was for the look for the yeah for the localization. Now for sensing, if you compare the what we can do in 5G, then we see that uh, most of the cases with radar we cannot actually address with the existing technology those requirements. And with lidar, there's um, yeah you can do a better job, but still there are things that you can do. For example, in case of velocity resolution, lidar doesn't do much really in velocity resolution. Um, so after doing this gap analysis, what we want to do is to actually have solutions for this localization to, to how, how we can close those gaps. And we started looking at, again, based on the methods and technologies that are developed in work package two, we started looking into what are the for example, how, what we can do with uh, when we move to higher frequencies, larger bandwidth, larger antenna arrays and such things. And these are just what I'm showing here are just some bounds basically based on Kramer-Rao bounds that we, uh, these are simulations that you can basically do what if uh, you take, um, for example, if I take uh, time difference of arrival in 6G and compare that to time difference arrival of 5G, then you see that with 5G you don't even reach to those, uh, for example, 90 percentile, which is the target that we want to have. And this is positioning uh, error bound, for example. I have a few other use cases that maybe we don't have time to go through all of them. But, but anyway, it seems that with, uh, with 6G we can actually, uh, at least this uh, Earlier, uh, this early studies they, they show that we can actually uh, get 
closer to what we want. But uh, uh, but again, this is not everything that is possible. We just took whatever technology we have in 5G and just increase the bandwidth or increase the antenna array. So I wouldn't take these numbers as what is uh, what we we do in the best we can do in 6G, basically. Uh, then another thing is to actually sensor fusion, how we and what we can do when we when we combine information from different sensors. Um, uh, and here we 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 have different directions that we want to look at. One is that we want to see how we can do the online adaptation and best sensor optimization. If say that you have ten sensors, how you combine the information that you get from these ten different sensors and also the trade-offs between complexity and performance, and also interference scenarios, how you can actually avoid interference. Here I'm, we are showing some example of how you can coordinate so that you reduce uh, the interference, basically, by, uh, yeah, by uh, which one of them are actually transmitting, which ones are listening and stuff like that. Um, so we have also some uh, uh, planned demonstrators, and I am showing two of them here. That uh, in one of the demonstrators, we are what we are uh, what we want to do is that we want to see whether we can do sub centimeter sensing with a uh, with this bi-static scenario, so that you have a transmitter, a reflector, and a receiver on the other side, and then you want to do this with the with the sub terahertz and the goal is a sub some sub-centimeter range resolution. The other scenario is that we want to do the same thing with multi-static, which is, for example, one is transmitting, two are receiving the reflections, and then um, also with the hard hardware impairments, so uh, which is looking a bit into more realistic scenarios. Uh, what if you have, for example, different uh, uh, phase noise if you have, or PA nonlinearities and things. Um, and finally, what we uh, what we want to do here is that we want to look into the sensing uh, services and what services we can say say that we have these uh, uh, sensing that is integrated into communication. Now, what we can achieve with that? And then here we want to basically develop a vision on how we can actually enable and enable new applications and also enrich uh, enable existing uh, new applications and enrich uh, existing applications based on the location based services and emerging services um, also another thing is that we want to see like i said in the beginning we want to see how we can actually improve communication using the knowledge that we have for on on the sense on the position of a of uh, objects and also the the velocity of them and such kind of information how that can actually be leveraged to use to in, improve the communication and uh, also obviously one thing that we have to look into is uh, the requirements for uh, uh, supporting this new emerging, new and emerging use cases, which is the, what is the sensing signal design? Is it the, for example, one of the existing signals should be used for that, or we need to have something new uh, besides the uh, sounding reference signal or positioning reference signals, and also coordinate uh, interference coordination. Um, Yeah, uh, so basically the summary of this uh, presentation is that uh, what we see in HEXA-X is that localization and sensing is an integral part of 6G and, and, and not an, just an add-on. So it's basically, it can use we can use communication for sensing and we can use sensing for to improve the communication. Uh, what we did so far in this study, we we did the study of the use cases and also we did a gap analysis. And the gap analysis was done for both positioning and also the sensing based on uh, radar and LIDAR. Um, then 
after this gap analysis, we started working on the methods to for localization and sensing. Just what I what I said uh, about uh, how we can actually use this uh, improvement in 6G communication to basically to improve sensing and also the services that this can uh, this can enable. And then the planned work is that we want to. Uh, work on some demonstrators regarding the sensing and localization to in the sub terahertz, both for uh, uh, bi-static and multi-static. That was all I had, and sorry that I had to rush a bit in the end. Thank you. Time. Ali, yeah. mm -hmm. I think we have time for a short question, if there's one. Uh, audience? If not, you can post the question in chat and Ali can respond to it. So interesting Absolutely. overview of the sensing uh, uh, activities in XX. Thank you. Thank you. So if we move on with the agenda, the, now we've heard from HexX and we move on to another ICT52 project from RISE 6G, Reconfigurable Intelligent Sustainable Wireless Environments for 6G Smart Connectivity by Vincenzo. He can pronounce his own last name. <laughs> That's gonna. Yes, sh sh can, you. can you hear me right? I can hear you. Yes. Thanks. So, good morning, everybody. I think uh, it's still sharing. Give me one second. Uh, can you see it, right? Yes, we can see it and hear you. Fine. Good. So, good morning, everybody. Thanks for uh, joining this, uh, this session. I'm Vincenzo Shankalepore, principal researcher at NEC uh, Europe Labs in Heidelberg in Germany and also project technical manager of this uh, ICT52 funded project, RISE CG, that focuses on the reconfigure intelligent sustainable environments for 6G wireless networks. Today I'm going to bring you to a journey among such emerging and now some devices, namely RIS, Reconfigurable intelligent surfaces, showing you relevant business use cases, corresponding technical challenges, and expected solutions. Of course, your valuable comments and questions are more than welcome. So let's move on. Okay. <clears throat> the journey started with a very strong consortium. We put in place seven different academic partners and research institutes, two manufacturers such as NEC and Greener Wave, and two major European telco operators, Orange and Telecom Italia, who will, say, will help establish two different field trials, respectively, at the end of the project lifetime. In particular, NS SNCF, the French train company, will deploy RIS in a public environment, such as the railway station in Rennes, and Fiat CRF will also apply the new RS, RIS paradigm onto their kitting operation in one of their facilities in Italy. We'll see this in two details in the next slide. So now jumping into the key concept, reconfiguring intelligent surfaces are man-made passive surfaces of electromagnetic materials that can be controlled electronically. This would break the classical communication paradigm where the propagation environment is envisioned as a black box, providing a new tool to control wave propagations and enhance the overall communication performance. And this uh, would open up to new business cases where existing network deployments can be enhanced with affordable CAPEX and OPEX. Indeed, RIS are supposed to be low cost, low complex and lightweight devices. In this nice picture here, you can see uh, RIS installed on the glasses to control the signal propagation reflection and steer the beam towards predefined directions. RIS is taking its main role on the road toward the 6G. RIS technology poses the control of the propagation environment, enabling interesting novel applications. And this is, let's say, attracting industrial and academic uh, interest around the world, given the possibility to easily deploy 
lightweight and cheap devices that would need very limited control. So what are the key challenges Rising GM to explore? In principle, given uh, uh, the novelty and innovation behind such a new technology, the scope of the project might be quite wide. We, let's say, we move from designing innovative uh, algorithms for the channel estimation that would involve a number of technical challenges never experienced so far for the, uh, to the definition of automated mechanism to properly control such devices that will be driven by open protocols pursuing high capacity connectivity, energy efficiency, limited electromagnetic field exposure and high localization accuracy. In addition, we are currently investigating fundamental limits of RIS based networks with ray tracing simulators and empirical experimental campaigns. This will be, let's say, the key for uh, the novel concept of uh, dynamic programmable wireless propagation environments. So in particular, we pioneered the wireless environment as a service, uh, as a service concept. Smart services can be deployed in uh, indoor and outdoor scenarios, adding a new degree of freedom to the classical communication paradigm and providing, again, full control of the propagation environment. In the picture here depicted, RISs are used to help delivering autonomous driving solution, support first responders, as we'll see later, thereby focusing in pinging signals towards specific areas and isolate public areas where the electromagnetic field exposure, for instance, must be alleviated. In addition, AI-based orchestration mechanisms may be implemented on edge computing platform that, let's say, will directly communicate with, with the RIS devices as part of the novel network edge. So the first activity is carried out within uh, the project framework in the in this first in the first year, have to identify main reference scenarios, corresponding use cases and relevant metrics and key performance indicator and, and uh, so KPIs. We focus on both sub six gigahertz and millimeter waves, frequency band that could, let's say, be translated into 5G FR1 and FR2 between 26 and 28 gigahertz. But let's say no limits on uh, working at higher frequencies. We classify the RIS as reflecting the RIS and transmitting RIS, plus reflector array and transmitter array that would be controlled by one single RIS controller. Uh, currently, we are designing a, and printing RIS prototypes based on reflector array technology that will be used for final project demonstrations in real environments. The main reference scenarios are for enhanced connectivity and reliability, enhanced localization and sensing, and, fin and finally for, uh, let's say, enhanced sustainability and security. Each of those, let's say, is directly and properly addressed in the corresponding technical work package. Then, supported by the two verticals involved in the project, we have listed the relevant metrics that will be used for showing the real benefit of this technology. So you can see something like latency, spectral efficiency, localization accuracy, delay, and integrity, self electromagnetic field exposure utility, and also the secrecy spectral efficiency. All details are, let's say, public and explained in the, in the last, in the recently published deliverable of the project that you can see here. So uh, finally, let's say RIS can also be used for, as I said before, specific emergency scenarios where the 3D connectivity paradigm is uh, exploited. Being passive devices, no active circuits are supposed to be installed, resulting in a very limited energy consumption that, let's say, makes uh, such a technology suitable for being, for instance, installed on UAV or HAP. This uh, nice picture here unveils the main benefit of applying RIS technology in emergency scenarios, being able to provide connectivity, for instance, to hard to reach locations. 
but let's say I, I would refer you to this list of the publication in case you you want to to know more details on on this kind of specific scenario. Now let's focus on the sustainability and security. Here we aim at let's say developing areas based networks with the innovative physical and Mac layers to boost the performance of existing wireless networks without densifying it with additional access points or base stations. The objectives derived with the two major European telco operators are bringing the network energy efficiency up to 10 times with respect to the existing solution, improving the electromagnetic field exposure efficiency up to 10 times, again, with respect to the state of the art, and enhancing the spectral security efficiency twice with respect to, let's say, what is there with respect to the existing solutions. Then what will be the final result? So uh, we plan, let's say, to set up, as I say, two physical field trial, focusing on communication performance and localization accuracy, respectively. In the first field trial, we will target kitting operations in industry 4.0 related scenarios. And the idea is to have what they call usually AGV, as you can see from the picture here attached, that let's say autonomously can go around within the, the FIAT, the CRF facilities, and that they need to be localized with a fine positioning solution based on an overlay risk-based network. This would bring, let's say, up to centimeters the localization accuracy using and improving the existing infrastructure they already have within the facilities that could be like local 5G network provided by the telco operator or even the Wi-Fi networks. On the other side, we target, let's say, what we call hybrid scenarios. The railway station in Rennes in, in France. In particular, this station shows two existing 5G base stations installed here, as you can see from this nice picture, to cover the entire station floor. However, the coverage, let's say, experienced in specific areas might appear limited as you can see from this nice radiation graph here, resulting in what we call usually dead zone. So installing a doc in a doc RIS deployment would enhance the overall coverage and solve the dead zone issue. <clears throat> then in addition, we'll also, let's say, design RIS based solution to isolate specific areas where the electromagnetic field exposure protection is required, like here, where let's say they would like to block on demand the 26 gigahertz signal. Therefore, we have seen potential benefit of the RAS technology, but still the overarching integration might be problematic as the densification of, let's say, such devices may require an ad hoc contour channel, which should be in line with current network architecture and paradigms. So we need to push for 5G and beyond compliant architectural blocks that may interact with the existing functional blocks while still guaranteeing the innovative concept of openness. So why openness is it's so important for us? First of all, it, let's say, may bring new business revenue sources into play and, and attract ad, ad, additional uh, business and market players. Because let's say blending together technologies and solutions from different stakeholders may further enhance the overall network efficiency. Second, it would not make uh, sense pushing for smart and innovative propagation environments where run elements cannot be dynamically reconfigurable. This is the reason why recently the ORAN, the Open Run, Alliance, which is trying to define a common guideline for running interfaces and protocol to, let's say, open uh, the market to new stakeholders is getting its, its momentum. And within this picture, we need to somehow define and place RIS related elements that can directly communicate with a redefined objects while leaving 
open ad hoc network configurations. This is, let's say, a kind of preliminary picture conceived by, by our project and published just a few months ago. <clears throat> In particular, we envision the novel uh, RISE controller, or even multiple controllers, directly plugged into, let's say, the ORAN compliant architecture. General scenarios, let's say, and uh, use cases may, may require a joint and also quite challenging optimization of both risk um, propagation parameters and, and settings, as well as the transmit beam forming configuration. And this would directly involve both the RICE controller, as you can see from the, the picture, and the near real time uh, run intelligent controller, the RIC, resulting in a potential, but not defined yet, interface among those two elements. And then this would realize according to a short term time scale, around let's say tens of uh, milliseconds, while long term decisions might be issued from the orchestration layer in tens of minutes. Well, uh, let's say this work um, will take time to convert to a solid and working solution before get, getting accepted. It might be a great uh, exercise to see how different components may talk to each other and integrate the risk devices within the, let's say, so-called open environment. And this will be the starting point for building scenarios where everybody can easily and flexibly install RIS to pursue specific objectives. <clears throat> Finally, I uh, would like to draw your attention on, the, let's say, the main uh, uh, standardization bodies effort, uh, as they uh, also started looking at the RIS as the key technology of upcoming network designs. Specifically, 3GPP already included the RIS as the potential topic to be explored in, uh, in future uh, study items for the release 18. And in parallel, ETSI, the European Standardization Body, launched the new ETSI RIS ISG in September 2021, uh, where, let's say, we'll have the first two years phase with an exploration phase, <clears throat> where, let's say, initial work items, like the ones you can see here, so the RIS-01 use cases and deployment scenarios, RIS-02 study on technological challenges and impact of, on networks and standards, and RIS-03 on communications models, channel models, and evaluation methodologies will be triggered to define main architectural building blocks, relevant use cases and scenarios, and interesting channel models. I think let's say this is my last slide, and this let's say closes my presentation today. Thank you. Many thanks. A very interesting presentation. Are there any questions from the audience? Doesn't seem so. There was posting a lot. I go ahead. Uh, do you have any possibility? Can we use this risk uh, solution in uh, 5G uh, network? I mean, the the risk, as you can see from this picture, can be integrated, let's say, within the the 5G run or let's say the run part here. Of course, the idea is just to install a lot of risk to control the propagation environment rather than installing active elements like base station or access points. Then the point is, let's say, how to integrate, as I said, the existing 3GPP or 5G architecture with whatever is coming, defining the risk ar architecture. This probably would be something challenging to address, but let's say nobody prevent, prevents us from installing and using RIS with the current 5G networks. Why not? Okay. Okay, thank you. What about your decision for standard 3GPP issue and uh, standardized will finished in 2023 to 2024 or before? I think you put to this uh, uh, picture is there. Yeah, but normally a uh, good scenario around uh, 27. Yes, so this one you can see here is related to Etsy RIS ISG. So the one, let's say, related to the European standardization uh, part, 
For 3GPP, of course, this will take much more time because they are discussing whether to include as a new study item the RAS within, let's say, this re uh, release 18 workshop. But then, of course, this will take much more time to, to convert to something uh, concrete. <clears throat> okay, thank you so, very yes. much. <clears throat> so, thank you very much. Uh, in the interest of time, I think we need to move on. Thank you very much for the Thank presentation. You. Thank you. Uh, if there are any questions, you can post them in the chat. Chance can reply to them. Uh, the next presentation is also on RAS uh, and R&D activities for 5G evolution and 6G focusing in RIS by Satoshi Soyama from Entity Docomo. Yes. Can you see my slide? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. So, hello everyone. Ah, just a moment. <laughs> oh. oh, video. Okay. So, sorry. Uh, my camera is doesn't work. Sorry, sorry, so speak. Only the speaking. Okay. So hello everyone. I'm a Satoshi Suyama of NTT Docomo. Thank you very much for inviting me to the very exciting workshop. I'm very happy and honored to join this workshop. Now I would like to talk about R and D activity for 5G evolution and 6G. Uh, focus on the Reconfigurable Intelligent Surface, RIS. So, as you know, 5G commercial service has been launched all over the world. We, Docomo, started research activity on the further enhancement of 5G, that is, 5G evolution of 5G uh, advanced and 6G. Docomo has released 6G flight paper and updated and published it as version 4.0 this January. Please check it. So this figure shows the Docomo's uh, require, requirement for the 6G. So it consists of the six elements, such as an extreme high data rate of more than 100 gigabit per second, extreme coverage, including the sky, sea, space, and extreme low latency of less than one millisecond end to end, and so on. So we believe the 6G technology should be introduced 5G system if they are feasible at an early stage. We are studying the 6G technology together with the further enhancement of current 5G, 5G evolution. This slide shows that Docomo's eight technical component for 5G evolution and 6G. Without a further explanation, they covered a wide range of technical area, including the new radio network topology, non-terrestrial network, frequency extension to software health, and further enhancement of basin MIMO technology. Docomo will aggressively tackle these challenges and promote our R and D activity for practical realization of 5G evolution and 6G. Okay. For new radio network topology, we need to realize cost-effective solution to improve the coverage and performance, not using the conventional base station antennas. We consider several solutions are listed here. For example, the RIS, Advanced Repeater, the IAB, and the wing deployment, such as the analog radio fiber, a loft and a pitching antenna, and a distributed MIMO and a cell-free MIMO. So 
In this presentation, I would like to focus on the ROIS. So first, let us explain the technical concept of intelligent radio environment, IRE, okay? Now, IRE attracts much attention as a useful approach to extended coverage area in millimeter wave, and it is a key technology concept for 5G evolution and 6G to aim the adaptively dynamically controlling the radio environment, real radio environment. Given an environment with a sun sealed object, okay, so IRE can secure propagation paths that make the pure detours around the shield object, okay, by optimally controlling not only the transmitter and receiver, but the propagation channel as well. So as you know, RIS is an essential technology for the achieving IRE and consists of multiple elements scattering the electric magnetic waves. Okay. So as you know, uh, metamaterial, metasurface technology are commonly used to achieve RIS and they can design and control the distribution of the scattering characteristic that is a refractive index, refractive index, okay? So we have already verified the potential of the metamaterial and metasurface technology by several experimental trials. Let us introduce these experimental trials briefly in this presentation. First of all, in 2018, we conducted the field trial using the prototype of the metamaterial like this. So metamaterial reflector working on the 28 gigahertz millimeter wave band. In this trial, the base station antenna is mounted on the roof of the building. The street under the building is endless environment, non line of sight environment. To cover the, this area, metamaterial reflector like this is uh, deployed and it adjusts to the reflect the beam to this area like this, okay? After the metamaterial reflector is deployed, more than 15 SNR enhancement and more than 500 megabit per second throughput enhancement are observed which demonstrates the effectiveness of the metamaterial reflector for millimeter wave coverage enhancement. Next, in 2020, we conducted a trial with a transparent dynamic metasurface. The transparent dynamic metasurface consists of the two transparent baseboards such as a metal surface board and movable board, as shown in this figure. And in metal surface board, the pre-designed pattern of the material, oh, metal material is printed. <laughs> okay. Please mute somebody. Okay. <laughs> so uh, in this, transparent dynamic meta surface, the operation mode can be controlled by the adjusting the distance of the two balls like this, okay? So three operation modes such as a full reflection mode and full penetration transparent mode and hybrid mode are supported. In the full transparent mode, the penetration loss of the meta material Meta surface is only about the one decibel. In the full reflection mode, the penetration loss is more than 10 decibel. Okay. So in 2021, last year, we developed a prototype of the meta surface lens for 28 gigahertz. This picture is a 
window glass uh, covered with a meta surface lens film. Okay, so the size of the prototype is 80 centimeter by 80 centimeter. The light sound figure shows the experimental setup. It is very simple. So measurement results show the meta surface lens can improve the received power on the focal point by 24 decibel or more compared with a normal glass window without the lens. If the repeater is deployed on the focal point of the lens, as shown in this figure, the indoor coverage of millimeter wave band can be further enhanced. Okay. So in order to verify the coverage enhancement by the combination of the meta surface lens and the repeater, indoor experimental trial was conducted. This slide shows the indoor trial environment. Okay, so 28 gigahertz base station antenna is deployed at this point, and the glass window with a meta surface lens like this is located at the entrance of the conference room and the repeater is deployed lo located on the hooker point of the lens like this okay so this is a measurement result of the indoor trial so first one the upper side figure shows a measured received power in the case of using the low glass window only, that is when the repeater and the lens are not used. Okay, so in addition, the middle side of middle side figure shows the measure received power in case of using the low glass window and the repeater. And the lower side figure so the measure of received power by adding the meta surface lens to the repeater. Okay. So from the this figure, thanks to the gain of the repeater, the received power increase. On the other hand, this figure shows the combination of the meta surface lens and the repeater can significantly boost the received power and major CDF like this of the received power can be also improved almost 10 decibel by exploiting the combination of the repeater and meta surface events. Okay. So next, let us introduce another prototype of user tracking meta surface reflector hole 28 gigahertz. We made a press release of trial result using this um, meta surface reflector in the last November. Uh, environment information, such as the position information, is collected from the receiver mounted on the robot. Okay, so this meta surface reflector dynamically change. Uh, reflection, reflection direction, reflection direction by using the position information. More specifically, more specifically, the received corrects the position data on the surrounded area, and the those data are corrected at the information server by using the Wi-Fi network instead of the 5G. And then by exporting the corrected data, the RIS controller adaptively change the reflection direction. Okay. Okay, so this is a measurement result. So this upper side figure show the received power without using the RIS reflector without the reflector. And the lower side figure shows the received power 
with uh, using the controlled RIS reflector to track the UE mobility. Okay, so gray line shows the walls. The base station was deployed at this point. 28 gigahertz radio wave is transmitted from the base station to the this wall. So in the lower figures, the the wave a uh, radio wave is transmitted from the base station to the RIS reflector. So, and the RIS, RIS reflector controls the reflection direction according to the mobility uh, receiver's position. The moving, the receiver, uh, moving receiver traveled from the loss area to the end loss area and measures the received power at each position, like this, okay? So as shown in upper side figures, the received power is an endless area becomes a very, very low level because the reflected wave is not measured without uh, RIS reflect, okay? So however, by exploiting the RIS uh, user tracking RIS reflector, the measure received power in the ENOS area can be improved by up to 20 decibel, as shown in this brief, due to, uh, thanks to the user tracking meta surface reflector. Okay. So, furthermore, in 6G, RIS may realize new transceiver architecture in the subtail health band. Let us introduce a large scale RIS aided massive MIME transceiver architecture for multi stream transmission. By adapting, um, by adaptively changing the beam footprint from the phased array antenna, PAA to the RIS sub array, we can equivalently change the RIS sub array spacing, okay? So the length in the loss channel can be increased to support the spatial multiplexing. Therefore, the data rate can be boosted. With our proposal, the data rate can be increased maximum two types up to the two types, two times, sorry, so up to two times higher than that of the conventional hybrid beam forming scheme with uh, classical massive MIME architecture, okay? So for UE located far from the Bay S by concentrating the footprint as shown in this figure of the PA beams on the RIS sahu are okay, just a moment. Okay, so single stream transmission can be realized to achieve the larger beam homing gain. And we have already proposed a near field beam forming scheme to exploiting the potential of the large scale RIS edit trans transceiver. On the other hand, for UE located near to the base station, by the scattering the footprint of the phase array antenna beams on the RIS like this, multi-stream transmission can be realized to achieve a larger spatial multiplexing gain. We think this RIS added mesh aided massive MIME transceiver architecture is very important for sub tier health 6G. Okay, so finally, let us introduce the result of 6G uh, system level simulation using the RIS. We think the system level simulation, system level evaluation of RIS is very important from the viewpoint of the mobile network operator MNO. By using our developed Real-time 6G simulator, downlink system throughput of 6G is using 
RIS was evaluated in the shopping mall environment like this. So this shopping mall environment is assumed to be the two-storied building, okay? So fixed BS with massive MIMARs installed on the upper wall side on the passenger of the second floor and the RIS is mounted on the column, the column. Uh, and the drone BS move at a constant speed under the second floor passage. Each human and robot and autonomous car carries a MS and several MS move at the three kilometer per hour. Crumbs are signboard a blocking object and others are not a blocking object. This table shows a detailed specification in the 5G and 6G system level simulation. Here, the center frequency in 6G is 100 gigahertz and the bandwidth is 8 gigahertz. 6G can achieve more than 100 gigabit per second user throughput by using the whole stream transmission. So let us show the system level simulation in shopping mall by the 6G simulator. From this scene, the simulator evaluated performance of the 6G communication. The figure at the left bottom shows the percentage of the user throughput. Currently, almost 70% of the MS can achieve the over 100 gigabps throughput. Okay. So next, the number of the fixed beam, um, fixed BS is double. The percentage of the over 100 gigabps throughput becomes approximately 80%. However, the performance of MS under the second floor passage is not improved due to the endless environment. Okay. Now, the, this is RIS. So now RIS added to cope with the blockage effect, then almost 90% of the MS can achieve the over 100 gigabps throughput. At present, many specifications are applied into the 60 simulator to perform the real-time simulation. In near future, further enhancement of the function and simulation accuracy will be performed. Okay. That is my presentation. I show the documents around the activity and preliminary study <laughs> result focus on the RIS for the 5G evolution and 6G. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much. A very interesting presentation. Uh, well, time for a short question. There's a question from chat. Uh, what software is used for such type of real-time simulation? Okay. So what kind of should we what software is used? Uh, so uh, it means a uh, 6G simulator, is it right? So it's your uh, internal Docomo simulator? Yeah, internal, uh, yeah, original internal simulator. So we have already uh, updated the uh, six, 5G simulator to the 6G simulator. Uh, Patrick, uh, I would have just a short question that can also be discussed in the chat. Uh, so thanks, Suyama-san, that you could uh, uh, join. How do you see the time to market for this kind of approach? Time to market to RIS. Yes. Ah, <laughs> it depends on the uh, frequency band. Of course, uh, so currently, we uh, our approach is to focus on the 28 gigahertz band. So it is easy to uh, realize a time to market for the millimeter wave. But so for in the case of the sub terahertz band, so it is a long time to achieve the practical realization for 6G, okay? Thank you. Uh, in interest of time, I think we need to move on with the agenda. 
Um, the next presentation is from another ICT52 project, Reindeer, um, presenting by Shun Chang. Hello, could you help me? Uh, that's not Reindeer. No, eh? no. Uh, not no even... sorry, 60 Brains. 60 Brains, uh, 60 Brains. Okay. Because apologies. I was a bit surprised, <laughs> okay. <laughs> my apologies. 60 that's Brains. Fine. Okay, I just to show my slide and... Okay, could you see my slide? Uh, you're in the presenter mode, so if you... Yeah, sure, yeah. It's okay. It's okay now. Uh, we see the presenter mode. So oh, okay. I, I think thing. I should change the the sharing mode. I don't know why it's like that. Okay. Okay, the simple way is I show my screen. I think it's much better. <laughs> I think it should be easy. So, it's okay. I think it's the full screen mode, no. yeah? No, it's okay. Okay. Okay, okay, thank you everyone. And my name is Zhang Xun and I come from France and uh, ISAP. And today uh, I will present our uh, uh, progress on my, in our uh, ICT 52 project, 6 Brain. 6 Brain is uh, one of the 10 uh, ICT 52 uh, project. And basically we start on the, um, the AI based and uh, Internet of Things and uh, resource location, and especially we focus on the massive connection and also focus on the industry environment. So, uh, the project started in more than one year. So, this presentation will be tried. We try to focus on the two, uh, two topics is the multi band chain management and the modern work. And also we try to address the another issue is like uh, the indoor high accuracy position approach. And this part of work is um, its main uh, contribution from our work page three and work page six. So uh, I think, okay, and everyone, everyone know already some, the, the roadmap and about our uh, ICT52 project and smart connectivity. So six brain projects, joint project with different and industry partner and also the academy partner in Europe from UK, France, Germany, Israel. And the objective for us is to try to study the problem. It means and in the future factory, in the future uh, um, industry environment, what is the, uh, what is the use case and the innovation point. So, and uh, we, uh, in considering the innovation point and the vision from the others, a standardization group and 5G AIA, et cetera, and in uh, collaboration with the different industry partner like Bosch, and we uh, try to define the different and six brain primary use case and uh, high requirements, as we mentioned here. And we try to focus on the indoor environment with a very high uh, device density, like we mentioned here, more than one, 100 mega per kilometer square, and also the high precision positioning is, um, as well we know, is one centimeter indoor, and also the 10 centimeter outdoor like that. So, and we are trying to uh, integrate the different and enabling technology, like multiband uh, spectrum used, like from the takeaheads, sub CGA and also the OWC, optical wireless communication. And based on those technology, we try to uh, think about and talk about how we can enhance the indoor positioning accuracy. So, and the, the use case or the scenario we're focusing on is on the industrial environment, like we say, and just like uh, we collaborate with Frankfurt to try to make the chain merchant in the, uh, industry and warehouse, and we are considered in the future uh, factory or warehouse. It will be considered the multi band, multi access technology like Takahat, Subsidia, and then enter to the VRC or OWC part. So, and that is the uh, use case vision in our project. So, and we define also the, the multi plane and uh, architecture in our CG based on the AI based management plan here. So we try to address the different enabling technology, like the enhanced new expression link from OWC and take heights, and also the high resolution in the position method, and also the D2D selfie network architecture, like we mentioned here, especially to target the highly dynamic and urge connection.
and also the E2T end-to-end -end directory network slicing currently. So today, and we are trying to focus on the network plan, especially to see the multi-access technology for the indoor environment for the uh, mo uh, for the mobile user equipment, how we can uh, start <coughs> guarantee the indoor access uh, <coughs> technology like that. So, so firstly, and the, we uh, to try to answer try to answer the the spectrum challenge like we defined in uh, in in five G vision like so the enhanced mobile broadband and ultra reliable and low latency communication. Uh, also, the last point, the massive machine type of communication. So the the new bandwise hangar application is focused on the operating frequency to the high band. So and in 6G, and we try to uh, focus on the available spectrum resource more than 90 gigahertz, and special for the gigahertz. And also, we are especially to thinking about how we can integrate also the visible light uh, spectrum also inside. That is why we are so interested in also to integrate the OWC inside also. So, and based on this and uh, very short context, and uh, the first point we want to do is the multi band channel modeling and also the mergement. The objective is uh, we try to and accurate uh, the radio transform channel model, and especially, just like I said, for the industry scenario. So we expect the future of this and the uh, RT model is could be helped us to determine this and also realize this, the location for the scatter for the informing location and imagine application and especially for the the future uh, factory. So for this accurate multi band simulation and we will try to consider it fully the with the frequency it's dependent the different publication characteristic and in considering the complex the indoor factory environment so and uh, that that is the objective for our six brain project and it, that means we are not just only to realize the publication poverty and we are trying to make the re-emergement from the rf emergement and also for the uh uh, optical and optical wireless communication and merchant and especially try to we can try to integrate them together in the frequency uh, domain like that. So to realize it, the roadmap we can say how to and how to we can realize it. We try to define this and uh, methodology and so based on the sixty frisk propagation measurement and monitoring. And we, uh, the firstly, we try to do the 3D laser scan of the scenario. This picture is, um, we did the 3D laser scanner in the uh, factory in Bosch. First step, we try to build the CAD model. And based on that, we will try to ins insert the electromagnetic property of the construction material. And then at the same time, we we'll try to do the uh, symmetry, the different multi-band sounder measurements from the sub giga mini wave takeout and also the OWC. And based on this uh, multi-band RF measurement, we we'll try to complete our RT model. And inside, we will try to integrate the different waveform to, to help to analyze based on the multi-band si simulation and measurement. And so and in this presentation, I think with the limit of time and we try to show the part of the progress of our work and especially like the mention here, how we can make this uh, uh, RT model. And in as the picture you can see here, that is a picture from the in the factory in, in the Bosch company. And you can see we we press the sounder on the in, in the <coughs> in the warehouse. Well and we try to select it, the certain uh, bound frequency from the 6.775, 30 giga and the 6 giga. And we, uh, it's here we can see the propagation distance between the transmitter and the receiver. We can see the attenuation of power. And based on that, and with the lasers, the 3D laser scanner, is we can try to help to build this uh, RT model. And um, and at the same time, and we try to and try to com 
combine the 3D point cloud data that we store in the point cloud and try to make the calibration in, in corresponding our RT model. So in this RT model, finally we build, it includes the certain and value and uh, material, like the different material, concrete, plastic, glass, and wood. It can see, it can include also the over uh, 10,000 object and the surface, as, as I can show in here. So, so some uh, primary and measurement results, and as uh, as well I can show in here, and this measurement will be useful later. We do the uh, RT calibration and validation, and uh, as well as you can see the with the different uh, two example here, like the 6.75 giga and the propagation band measurement, and we can see it much more very closely and corresponding our uh, simulation. And uh, so this feature in the next step here, and we will try to, some work we are working on is try to and impact it, the different radio and OWC interface. And the big problem or the, the gap we are made is attenuation of the OWC. The currently we try to use the infrared to, to integrate in our industry scenario. However, the the attenuation of the OWC channel is very significantly. So, and we are trying to, and also the bundle wise is very limited on the several megahertz. So, and that is the main problem we are trying to reduce and find a solution how we can integrate it, the, the radio and OWC interface together. So, and how we, uh, the multi band sounder, and we try to do is, the idea is based on the same sounder, the transmitter and receiver, we try to integrate it, the multi and band frequency together. It, it includes like the, uh, it includes the sub C giga, sub take a higher minimum wave and VLC together. So, and uh, the, I think with this picture is much more clearly, the, the idea is we are based on our UWB sounder and we try to and um, send in parallel the, the different bound frequency like the OWC and also the 200 giga, 70 giga and send to outside. The idea is based on the same positioning, the transmitter, we will try to scanner the environment and Based on this measurement, based on this measurement, and we can try to remodeling our uh, the new physics uh, synchronous propagation from the micro uh, microwave to the take eyes and also to the OWC. So, and this measurement, the attenuation is could be very in interesting and very important for our second part of work. Just like, and I would like to mention here, it's for the uh, uh, localization part. Because we are consider and uh, the environment of the in the new in the future factory could be very dynamic and uh, ultra tense. It consists of very high density uh, IoT devices. So how we can and guarantee the uh, the position accuracy and also to answer the the changement of environment uh, dynamically. That is the first question we will try to uh, try to answer. So the for the position accuracy, the, our objective is try to re, uh, reliable the the sub centimeter level positioning through the different method. The firstly, the different positioning technology based on the optical wireless channel, based on the millimeter wave channel, and also uh, we try to make the multi sensoring, multi location uh, sensoring data fusion try to represent to guarantee the the centimeter level positioning, uh, not only on 2D, but also on 3D, like the sub one centimeter and uh, uh, one degree arrow like that. So uh, here you can see that is the, uh, the framework and for our location base, like the remote radio light uh, uh, controller and it will be connected with a different uh, uh, remote radio light hand and for the UE side, he can get the two kind of the location sensory information. Uh, for the downlink, we use the visible light uh, receives uh, synchronous strain for the downlink location. And for the uplink, we uh, we test with the, the minimum wave uh, turn of arriving uplink. So, and the the location uh, location sensory data 
will send will send send back to the location uh, database, like I mentioned here, the minimum wave uh, TOA and we will see RS emergement and also the others like antenna and the location coordinate. And based on that, and the server can calculate or the estimate the UE location. So that is the, the basic way uh, the framework and what we are working on. So the first step work and we uh, we try to build the uh, indoor environment and the visible light positioning. And here in the picture, and we can try to simulate the uh, indoor visible light and positioning uh, <coughs> estimation environment. And we try to base on the, the different LED on the serine uh, of the laboratory and based on the test bed. And we even try to simulate with the loss and end loss uh, the optical environment. And in this environment, and we will try to discuss, try to measure the distance between the LED lamp and the receiver, as we show in this equation. But here, and uh, in the real case, uh, there should be get a very randomly and uh, receiver angle because the robot or the user, when it's moving on, the receiver angle should be uh, to get some um, possible and error here. So in this case, and we are specially and try to and apply some uh, our PSO and also the the different AI method to try to make the calibration. So here we show you just very primary result as shown here. We try to simulate the random angle change from one degree, in, the zero degree to the three degree. So, and with the result we can see before and with and without our algorithm, we can guarantee a very high uh, positioning accuracy less than uh, the one centimeter. So, with another uh, result we can show in here on the same laboratory environment, and we can see the position result with the traditional and RSS based VLP system. and the position error maximum could be given to uh, 0.3 meter. The average P position error is around the 0.31 meter like that. And based on our method, we can guarantee a position error is less than uh, one centimeter. And in the condition is, uh, is a natural laboratory condition. It consists of the natural light and th that is a um, that could be help us to continue to think about next step, how we can uh, integrate it in our uh, six brain and uh, location protocol later to guarantee the, uh, the positioning uh, results. So, and as I said, and like we test our OWCRSS mergement and meanwhile, and we use also the minimum way for the uplink, the TDOA uh, location. So if uh, the only issue, if we use the VLC, we cannot really to guarantee the 3D positioning accuracy. So in this case, we try to think about how we can make the multi location sensoring data uh, fusion to guarantee the 3D location. So that means our going work here, we try to, uh, uh, conducting the minimum way TDOA testing, and with our some primary result, we are especially considering the uh, synchronization time, the the latency to do uh, to get the data and send it back to the location server. With the primary result, we can see here uh, that is the result. How we can show how we can select it, the the part of the result and the estimate. This part of work is based on our previous uh, original project, internet radio light. So currently, and we can successfully to get the both uh, location sensoring data, and we will try to and uh, make the data fusion both on the two different location method, like the TDOA and RSS. The idea is hopefully in the near future to integrate also the the angle of arrive and also considering if we apply the system in the robot and how we can integrate the IMU data inside also. And based on the, the reinforcement learning technology, and we expect it can be help us to identify the changement of the environment, just like in the, in 
in the last uh, the slide I will show you. We expect in the future and uh, in the future factory or the indoor environment, it could be get the hybrid, uh, uh, hybrid multiband uh, access model, like you can see here. The, the different robots or the IoT devices will be connected with the smart IAB and um, within the different cluster. So the, the device could be moved randomly from one cluster to another one. So how we can consider the changement of the situation and how we can uh, guarantee the stable communication inside or the intra uh, cluster. And that is the question we are thinking. And also the idea in the next step, we will try to continue to think at the multi bound sound and the channel modeling and in, in this uh, industrial environment. And also, the, just like I said, the multi location data fusion uh, for achieving uh, the uh, <clears throat> for achieving the sub centimeters uh, position accuracy we are thinking to do. And um, and one more thing is very important: this is how uh, the system can and can detect the changement of the environment by using the deep reinforcement learning uh, method. That is some work we are uh, we are we are working on. So and some uh, some detail about the the part of the measurement of the use case and proof concept is the published already in our deliverable 2.5, and the the configuration and the setup of the 3D laser measurement of the factory in, in the Bosch has published already in the deliverable 3.1. Okay, if you are interested on those deliver, you can check in our uh, website the cgbrain.eu and deliverable part like that. And we have the larger part that is some event and the conference we participate in the last year in uh, so um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for your uh, for attention. I think this is all my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very interesting presentation on the 60 brains project. Are there any uh, quick questions from the audience? One question, how can one model a channel without channel soundings? For example, how to model a realistic LEO channel, although we can not do measurements in real? Okay, uh, I think I cannot see the question. Uh, maybe I, I just do quite on the full screen and I can, it's much easier for me to see the, see the question. Uh, just give me one second. I cannot find my screen. Sorry for that. <laughs> and also, how how can one model a channel without a channel sounding? For example, how to model a realistic EO channel so we cannot do measurement. Oh yeah. Uh, so we we have to do the measurement maybe, and uh, I didn't mention clearly. So that means we try to build our CAD model and we try to add the. Uh, the standard channel model inside, and mean, meanwhile we try to do the the measurement, just like I show in this uh, in my slide, we, and just like I said. So um, so definitely that is what we are working on. We uh, we have a, the the channel model is based on the is based on the measurement is based on the measurement side. That is uh, just like I said. We are the both part is done in in parallel for that, and then based on the measurement result, we will try to make the calibration uh, uh, in our RT model. I don't know. I I, I answer clearly the question or not. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you. So, if you have any further questions, you can ask them in the chat. Um, but in order to move on with the uh, schedule. We go over to, now it's Reindeer with Lisbeth van der Pair. So we can see your slides. You can see my slides? Yes, and we can hear you. Perfect, thank you. So it's going to be a bit different presentation. We had this morning already some uh, introduction on the use cases we consider in radio waves and, and what we say radio waves technology is, which we study in Reindeer. But today I want to talk also about the search for drastic energy reductions. 
I think it's clear we agree that um, what's been said by the European Union is that how to make Europe greener and more digital are the twin challenges for our generation and our success in meeting them will define our future. And now the question is, are these targets that will reinforce each other or are they somehow contradictory? And uh, I'll try to shed a light on that. So for sure, companies like Ericsson are already uh, making it clear on their website that building sustainable networks is key. So mobile data traffic is projected to grow significantly, but service provider must simultaneously reduce energy consumption. And here it says reduce energy consumption. So it doesn't say increase energy efficiency. It really actually says reduce energy consumption as a total absolute value. So I think that is uh, going further in ambition than a lot of things we said about energy efficiency. And I'll try to explain you why. So if you look at sustainability and, and can we future world wireless networks keep the pace in, in energy efficiency progress, there we can say, yes, there has been a lot of progress over different generations. And just looking at 5G, comparing it with 4G, um, it's been said that compared to 4G, and this is from a mobile operator in Belgium, but I think we have lots of reasons to um, to bring similar kind of arguments, is that compared to 4G, 5G takes 10 times less energy to carry the same amount of data um, compared to 4G. And there's two important things there. There is carry the same amount of data. So this energy relates to carrying the information over the air. So this is link energy. And also the 10 times it may read as something uh, yeah, very high progress, of course, a, a very high increase in energy efficiency. But is it enough? Well, Ericsson Mobility Report is issued at least once a year or since 10 years. So there was a 10th year edition in 2021. And there it says, looking back over the last 10 years, the mobile networks carry almost 300 times more mobile data traffic than in 2011. So even with 10 times better energy efficiency, since the absolute volume of mobile data has increased with a factor of 300 in absolute energy consumption, this is not a progress. We, we, are, we are in trouble. So you could ask yourself, first question, are we given an unequal fight? And the second question, has the fight for capacity been given priority over the fight for energy efficiency or energy consumption in total? And I think by asking these two questions, actually, I, I already answered them. So I think, yes, this is a kind of unequal fight. Even if we do an order of magnitude better, uh, it's not sufficient and also looking at all the use cases we have been discussed uh, today and a lot of the presentation looking, for example, at, at, at uh, very high frequencies and everything related to that. Yeah, we go to the very high frequencies mostly because of the capacity and it's still a priority because we see a lot of new use cases that ask for this high throughput for this very high throughput and very um, advanced applications. So I think, yes, to some extent, in my opinion, and, and maybe I'm a bit provocative, we have been given and we are given capacity a priority over, over energy efficiency. And I think there's been some messages and I know that this is uh, going to be not the end of the story, but so if they say super fast, but not so clean, China's 5G network is causing its carbon emission to soar and remarks based on that. Um, well, even if there are some notes to be made that future upgrades might be more uh, yeah, optimized for energy efficiency, I think still we will not see in 5G total energy consumption go down with respect to 4G. The point just is that you cannot fool physics. Uh, there is an, a lot of physics involved in doing wireless communication. You need to get the bits over the air and that requires energy to, to carry them. But also you need uh, energy in the hardware to generate the waves and you need to get them over the network. So I think just looking at physics and, and doing the math right, 
and, and seeing what we want to do, it will be very hard to do better in energy consumption as a total. So I raising the question towards zero carbon networks, what, what to do? I think my graph on the right already says, and I'm in line here a bit with what Aaron has also said, and I'm happy he has been clarifying a number of things for me, so I don't have to explain everything, is uh, going distributed will help for a number of reasons. Distributed with a lot of antennas will help, and trying to build a network that can uh, actually be operated based on sustainable energy, like uh, uh, solar energy, uh, it can be a way forward. But we need to, on top of that, we need to uncover the challenge really crisply. We, we need to do the physics right, the math right. We need to define adequate metrics to see, can we really progress towards zero carbon networks? So first, understanding the problem much better is, is one question. The second thing is we need to address all the major contributors, and that's not only the energy that goes over the air. There's a lot of other energy involved. Uh, so energy efficiency is not only about transmit power, it's about much more than that. And I think as a third thing, we should build a network with experts on sustainable energy. For example, avoiding cooling uh, can help in just avoiding to have energy spent on something that is not really related to the communication and so on. So in what I will still say in the next slide and my explanations, uh, if you want to know more about the analysis, the results and the ideas, uh, I have been using here ideas and, and analysis and so on from two major deliverables of reindeer, deliverable 2.1 and deliverable 3.1. But also there is my personal experience, some discussions. I think it's been uh, yeah, validated to some extent by the first presentation of this afternoon, come into this uh, presentation. And um, if you have any questions, because I, I know I will be implicit in view of time, you can raise them in, in the chat as well, or you can just send me emails afterwards as well. So first question is, what about the challenge? Let us incorporate the challenge and let us define adequate metrics. Well, if we look at the goals and we say there is a new generation of mobile networks every 10 years, and I think that's what we have seen and where we see 6G predicted, as we have seen this morning as well, it's, it's about 10 years since the beginning of 5G that we will see the beginning of 6G. And then if we suppose there is a 50% growth every year, is this realistic? Well, over the last 10 years it was more, eh? because 50% growth gives us uh, 100 uh, increase in 10 years. So it might be less, but it might as well be more. So I don't think uh, we, we can count on the fact that is not uh, the case. Well, if that's the case, then 6G needs to be 100 times more energy efficient just to stay on par in absolute terms. So that me would mean that we are not reducing energy consumption in the network. That would mean that uh, compared to 5G, 6G would stay on par. If we assume that mobile growth is slowing down a bit compared to what we have done in the last 10 years, so we would gain a factor of three compared to the 300, but mobile growth would still continue to, to grow. So if we say, well, maybe we get lucky um, and uh, there is a bit less mobile growth, yeah, then we might do a bit better if we have a hundred times uh, increase in energy efficiency, which is enormous. So I think we need to quantify this goal. I was happy to hear a lot of people have mentioned energy consumption and sustainability today, but I think we should be very clear on, the, on what the ambition really needs to be. And if we want to be serious about this and we agree on the numbers here, then we should look for a factor of 100 uh, more energy efficient. The next thing is that this, this 100x gain actually should apply to all the contributors to the energy consumption if they are all relevant and significant, of course, but they are. And so the total energy consumed in the network, in the wireless network, let's say, um, is first of all the energy for the link. That's the, the energy you, you actually really need to put the bits to carry them over the air related to the transmit power, as simple as that. But then there's also the energy consumed in the hardware, the transmit and the receive. You need circuits to uh, get the, the signals out. So whatever you do before the power is out, you need to spend energy in the hardware to generate these signals, potentially at a very high frequency. 
And then there's still energy in the network to connect whatever you have received uh, to the network. So even if we would say we can, with some clever tricks, gain a factor of 100 on the link energy, the transmit power, then the question still is, will we have this 100x also on the hardware, for example? And then looking at metrics, what are the adequate metrics that we should define? And I refer to our deliverable 2.1 and some references made there. Well, I think we have used joule per bit um, as, as an energy efficiency metric that is very meaningful at full load. So for, for high capacity networks, for, for full loads, um, looking at energy per bit is important because we will have more and more bits and then we can say, okay, the energy efficiency can increase. But if a network and when a network is operated well below capacity, the power consumption to cover an area in what per square meter is the most relevant energy efficiency metrics. And I think also that has been said today, we should build networks that can go down if traffic goes down. We should find ways to power off full parts of the system in a fine green way, not only in a, in a, in a, in a macroscopic way, um, to be able to scale down as well. If you're not in the full load, if you don't need the full capacity, because otherwise we might build a network that maybe in, in, in 20, 30% of the times um, is reducing energy, but in, in a lot of the time is, is actually spending way too much for what it's doing. So this is very yeah, comp compressed um, message, but I think I want to bring a key message here that it's, it's very difficult to achieve this just to stay on par if we think we are going to continue with the same mobile growth. I think we should also be aware of uh, greenwashing. And um, it's my personal two cents, and I hope I'm not going to, um, I want to open the discussion, so please, I don't want to be very extreme in here, but one thing uh, that we have been saying, and of course I'm also working on IoT, so I say the same things, is yes, wireless networks can help increase sustainability in cities, in agriculture, whatever. But no, massive IoT is not and will not be responsible for the high mobile data volume. If you do some basic math, um, in IoT you can do a lot with messages of 100 bit, and just try to calculate how many you get in five megabyte uh, picture or how much of them you get in 10 minutes of, of ultra high definition video, which is about one gigabyte. So even if there are millions of IoT devices sending 100 bit messages, one 10 minute ultra high definition video is going to generate the same traffic. So what I want to bring as a message is that massive IoT that we will deploy and help uh, to increase sustainability, I don't think we can use this as a greenwashing for the fact that we will have these very high throughputs that will generate the real impact uh, in energy uh, consumption. Another two cents, uh, or, or the second cent I would say is, yes, millimeter wave can provide good uh, e-link efficiency in nanogel per bit. If you have a very high data rate with many antennas, then on the link, yeah, you can see just in transmit power versus how many bits you get through, you can do something energy efficient. But no, I don't think it's just a matter of time before the hardware energy penalty disappears for short packets. So I think everything that um, Arno has been saying, that there is a gap and it's much more difficult to build hardware with the same energy efficiency to generate a very high frequencies. And I think intuitively it makes sense. If you first need to get the waves at a very high frequency, you need to get them up uh, very high. It's going to be much more difficult. It's going to ask much more energy. So for short packets uh, and, and where the, the overhead becomes bigger, and maybe also for high mobility where the many antennas become a problem because then you have a very narrow uh, beam and it's very difficult to stay in the beam. So you, you would prefer to have a bit broader beams, but then broader beams means less, less uh, gain. There I think we should really question whether millimeter wave is, is the way forward. And um, 
I'm not criticizing any project discussing these things today. I've just seen uh, papers that, that I received for review, for example, that advocate millimeter wave for IoT. Well, personally, I don't think that, that makes sense uh, with the current state of hardware and maybe never, because IoT links, um, I don't think they are uh, an argument for going up to very high frequencies. Okay, so we will need to address all the contributors in, uh, in energy consumption. You need to mind the physics and do the math correctly. And what we will say is still very preliminary and simplified. So we're still starting uh, this part of the work consistently in, in reindeer. Uh, so I think for the link energy, one thing, of course, what we have seen over previous generations is that spectacular improvements have been made for all consequent uh, generations, and we'll need to continue that. And main uh, physical ways to do that is shorten the link distance, of course, improve the directivity of transmission with, uh, with steerable antennas, and optimize for actual propagation and real antennas. I think the real antennas is something that in 5G we have been to some extent forgetting with the central massive MIMO, and with the distributed massive MIMO, in my opinion, that's, that's going to be a significant step forward that we're going to use antennas into the direction that they are best fit for. Uh, we know that we don't have omnidirectional antennas and that we cannot steer them uh, efficiently in all directions. The second is the hardware energy. And conventionally, the hardware energy has been dominated by the PA. The good news is that this, to some extent, is very much related to the link energy. So if we can reduce the link energy, we will also reduce the output requirements of the PA. So those reinforce each other. You could say if we gain a factor of 10 on the link, we will also be able to reduce the output power and reduce the power used by the, by the PAs by a factor of 10. So that's a good thing. Another thing still is the back of the efficiency. It's also been discussed today. So that remains a bottleneck. We should look at um, waveforms that can allow our transmission techniques or, or precoders that allow to work much closer to the saturation point of the PA. And we have promising results there. So I think there is still uh, gains to be made, fortunately, in, um, in working on the PAs. But uh, once again, having a factor 100, well, fortunately, I would say we can gain from the output power, but in the efficiency and so on, there is not a factor of 100 to, to, to gain. Going from 4G to 5G, we have seen, unfortunately, that the ASCII complexity is somewhat catching up with the RF power and specifically the PA power. And in, in previous generations, uh, it, it always came back, definitely for large scales, that the digital part was not that power hungry with respect to the transmit stage. But in 5G, um, it's been reported that this is not the case. And this is due to the algorithmic complexity, but also due to the hardware platforms efficiency at the base station. So in Massive MIMO, for example, we are able to build very low complex user terminals, but we have been moving a lot of the complexity to the base station side. The base station side that for good reasons, to some extent are implemented based on FPGAs that are reconfigurable. And that if you look at the total life cycle and, and, and the footprint, the carbon footprint of base stations, of course, having FPGAs there is interesting so that we don't need to upgrade them with new hardware all the time. So it's not as simple as to say, let's put ASICs in base stations and, and we will resolve this, uh, because then uh, we will have another ecological impact. And also just going from FPGAs to ASICs will not be sufficient. It might be needed, but not sufficient. And I think the third thing in the hardware to consider, as uh, Arno has explained, is we should mind the gap between below 10 gigahertz and very high frequency. And then on the network side, what can we do? What should we do? I think we should consider early data reduction uh, on the deep edge, decentralized storage and so on. If you look at the increase of traffic, I think the only way if people continue uh, sending more and more mobile data is, is to avoid that they overflow the network, to try to see um, how can we do transcoding, how can we do other things as close as possible to the devices to somehow try to reduce uh, the data in the network. 
and and maybe sooner or later it will be clear that that um, yeah we we need to go much further so this is a bit counter the the whole idea of putting everything in the cloud and 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 centralizing everything i think we also need to see from an energy and bandwidth perspective whether we can do decentralization of some things so I think if you look at the device, uh, diversity of, of use it, cases it, that has uh, been presented. Yeah, how much longer uh, if you could wrap up? Yeah, um, how can we serve them? Is good enough good enough? I would say we need to move to electric cars like we have with normal cars. Uh, but I think for IoT, we should also consider battery less devices for massive IoT like bikes that don't have any uh, impact at all. And for extreme throughput and long distances, I say we, we should go to fixed wireless access and or fiber and consider other solutions. So, of course, what is the advantage or where do we think that um, radio weaves technology can help? Well, first of all, distributed massive MIMO is going to bring proximity and diversity. So the E of the link will go down. I think for hardware efficiency, we are investigating uh, efficient PA operation and reduction of DSP complexity. And we're focusing on the golden below 10 gigahertz uh, frequencies that also allow to um, have a better energy efficiency. And then uh, the distributed resources in the radio weaves, they um, support decentralization, but uh, still 100 times improvement on all aspects is, is extremely ambitious. So I'm just going to, as a last point, um, show a preliminary result which has been comparing the central case on the right hand side with an equal number of antennas to a distributed case on the left hand side and what you see here and i refer to the reindeer deliverable 3.1 the blue upper one is the central case you see if we go to distributed cases definitely on four walls so we don't even need four strips but four walls you see that the transmitted power the required transmit power um, and the probability you need a high transmit power for having full coverage there, you have the potential to gain this factor of 100 and even more. But this is only for the transmit power, so this is definitely not the end of the story. But this shows that we do believe that going to the distributed case and the diversity and the proximity of devices definitely is an important step forward in energy efficiency. So to conclude, on the road to zero carbon and other important uh, sustainable development goals. We should not only look at energy, but also at waste, for example, when we would consider replacing FPGAs. We think there is a great potential in the distributed deployment of radios and computer resources. Uh, I think consumption and energy consumption should be base principles start from and not something we consider as an optimization uh, criterion afterwards. I think interacting with battery less devices for massive IoT can prevent a toxic waste disaster and we should dare to innovate bravely, know where the bar is when we start and try to get there and prioritize KPIs and, and also KVIs that target sustainable development goals. I don't know whether there has been any uh, questions coming in the chat. Um, thank you very much, Lisbeth. I think in thank order you. to uh, allow the final presenters time to present. Uh, we have to take the questions in the chat. Um, but uh, thank you for a very interesting um, presentation. I think it's very important topics to keep in mind when we develop the next generation. So if you have any questions, uh, please ask them in chat and Lisbeth can respond to them. But moving on to the next presentation is from the Damon project. ICT52 by George Yosifidis. Hello, everyone. You can hear me, I guess. Yes. Let me share my screen. So, can you see my screen? Yes. Hello. Welcome to the talk, the first talk of Demon. Uh, I guess I have 20 minutes. Is this right? Yes. Great. So, I'm George, I'm an assistant professor at uh, Technical University of Delft, not very far from the previous uh, speaker. I'm going to talk about uh, DEMON. Uh, DEMON is, uh, stands for Network Intelligence for Adaptive and Self-Learning Mobile Networks. Actually, uh, there are uh, three talks of DEMON, uh, about DEMON in this uh, workshop. One follows after me uh, by Andres uh, Garcia-Saventra. 
and there is the overview uh, talk about from um, um, Marco Fiore tomorrow. So Demon is led uh, by IMDEA. Marco Fiore is the PI there. And uh, the technical coordination is by NEC uh, and uh, in particular by Andres. And uh, today I will present in very, uh, very briefly in this next 15 or so minutes, some of the results that have to do with energy aware orchestration of virtualized runs. Here we will present a set of experiments and some algorithmic solutions we have uh, thought and tested uh, that are compliant with the uh, old discussion about the ORAN architecture and are inspired by the main ideas we have in Demon, which is how to automate this type of orchestration solutions and how to go beyond the data transfer as a functionality of the network. But this is only one of the many things that we have done in Demon. I can say with confidence and you will see more later. So let me please, uh, although it's not necessary for this audience, present a very, very quick uh, overview about the context, how we think about uh, these uh, problems. So as we usually say, there is indeed a new era for wireless networks, right? And not only we have new services to deliver, but also new clients, all these autonomous vehicles, robots are new clients. And uh, in our view, this requires a shift in the way we design networks. So 6G and beyond should be uh, uh, in focused on that shift. And to put things in perspective, historically, we are now at the point that we would like to rethink our networks that support new services, new intelligent services, which go beyond transferring data from one point to the other or beyond increasing the content delivery capacity of our systems, right? So when we say intelligent services, of course, this is not a standardized uh, term. We can think of uh, edge AI, edge analytics, mobile analytics, anything that goes to the end user with some information, some inference. And I will give a couple of specific examples. So this service is required to collect the data, decide from where, how much data to collect, how to transfer the data, which routes to use, how fast, and even how and where to process the data. For instance, how much computing power, how the GPUs should be tuned to process the different uh, data streams of the users, but also which libraries to use. Okay, so we have new decisions, we have new metrics, accuracy of inferences, number of successful AI tasks that we want to deliver to the users. In the same way that we did mobile video, a utility, right, that everyone has access to through here or his mobile phone, in the same way we envision to deliver these intelligent services that are concepts such as utility of information. These are all things that we think and study in Demon. And of course, plenty of trade-offs that uh, make our uh, everyday professional life even more exciting trying to address these trade-offs. Among these trade-offs, one that uh, we particularly focused in this uh, thread of works is uh, energy. Because energy is not only expensive, it's not only important from a climate point of view. We all know there are papers from 2010 talking about the CO2 emissions of wireless networks. Green networking, green communications is a big uh, thing. So, but also from a performance point of view. So you have energy being expensive, being important from a performance point of view, being important for the climate. Okay, uh, if you like, uh, the way I describe this problem is that energy is the common currency that all these different data transmissions, data collections, data computations uh, need, uh, rely upon. And there is an opportunity which is the softwareization of networks and the convergence of computing and communication operations, tasks that previously were, if not done by different communities in uh, academia and in industry, at least in different uh, settings or in different time scales with different tools. Now we focus on this uh, at the same time. So talking about softwareization, we focus uh, on virtualized base stations and how we can softwareize and leverage this fact, this technology at the radio access network. So the focus here was to improve and orchestrate uh, virtualized base stations using um, platforms, for instance, like SRSLTE, who is a partner, SRS is a partner in Demon or Open Air. And unfortunately, or fortunately for those who like solving problems, this flexibility of softwareization at the run comes at a cost. What is this cost? First of all, it is difficult to configure these new machines because there are there is a large a range of options how to configure them. You have access to them in uh, almost real time, and this creates uh, uh, challenging decisions to be made in such a small time scale. 
And since many of the radio, many of the computations that are involved in these operations are softwareized, uh, it is difficult to predict the resource consumption, in particular the energy that these devices uh, spend. And I will show some experiments that uh, uh, support these uh, uh, claims. So we studied two, or if you like, three problems in a series of papers. Um, how to configure the base stations, how to select the transmission power, MCS airtime, in order to maximize the throughput that this device uh, uh, serves, delivers, and minimize the power that it consumes, a weighted objective, if you like. A different twist that has different practical applications is how to maximize the throughput while uh, um, while satisfying a hard power consumption threshold. Imagine you have a power over Ethernet uh, supported base station, then you cannot, without a battery, then you cannot exceed a certain power uh, threshold and you would like to maximize the performance subject to that uh, operational constraint. And going a step further, we wanted to see how we can maximize the specific quality of service metric for the intelligent service for instance, the mobile inference service, I will give a specific example. So we jointly optimize the virtualized base station, the software base station, a net server that delivers this service at the uh, located at the run, and the UEs that uh, also have to make some decision so as to have the best possible end-to-end -end, uh, service performance. Okay, so again, we don't maximize throughput, we don't minimize delay, we maximize the mobile inference accuracy or the inference accuracy for this mobile service. Okay, to start with, we want to answer what is the performance and the energy consumption of virtualized base stations. Okay, and you will see that this is different from what we knew uh, about the legacy base stations that uh, we have tested and profiled uh, uh, for a long time. And after we understand that uh, these machines are different, then we need to come up with an optimization, a principled way to maximize the operation of these systems. Why principle? What do I mean by that? I mean, in a way that we know that this is how far we are from the optimal operation. These are the assumptions that we need to satisfy, or um, this is what more we can do. Okay, so we know we want to have like a very systematic approach to uh, optimize, to configure this, uh, this uh, virtualized base stations. You can find the details if you want in this uh, paper that uh, it was um, presented in Infocom this year, and uh, there is a follow-up uh, journal in mobile computing coming. So we used a representative for this situation base station, uh, test bed scenario. The typical uh, uh, USRPs, we used SRS LTE, as I said before, um, and the power meters and measured the consumption of the base station when you have uh, uh, transmissions and different uh, configurations. And we measured actually some uh, things that uh, at least for me were uh, interesting to see and I saw them first time. For instance, we found that the uh, computing, uh, the power that is computed sorry, the power that is consumed in computing operations at the BBU is uh, comparable, if not larger, than the power that is computed in the radio unit for small size base stations. Imagine a small cell. Uh, we saw that the platform that hosts this software uh, machine, this chain of functions that implement the SRS, um, depends, affects the power consumption. So, this brings into the picture that the heterogeneity of the equipment affects the actual power consumption profile of what you do, of what uh, of the base station. We saw that uh, also the decoding time, which is now not performed in the context of uh, uh, with an FPGA, right, but through this uh, uh, software functions in generic purposes machines, that increases very fast for low SNRs and depending on the MCS. So this is intuitive and uh, rather expected, but the thing that we can take away from this picture is that there are uh, decisions to be made on how to select the MCS based on the SNR, and these decisions lead to uh, non-trivial increases in the decoding time. Okay, so if you allow the default scheduler to do this decision, you might end up with very suboptimal uh, um, operational points. I have too many figures actually, and I will just, uh, I'm just trying to give you a high level view of the, the gist of it, uh, which is that, for instance, 
if you try different configurations in a virtual base station, by configuration we mean the combination of the MCS, the airtime, then you might get the same throughput, you get the same throughput, but difference in energy power, energy consumption up to 38%. So you can achieve the same result, but if you tune it correctly, you can save 38% of uh, energy. Okay. And why is that? Again, because there are all these nonlinear interactions between the inputs and the outputs and the energy consumption. There is, of course, coupling between the uplink and the downlink, which is increased. There is a large portion of the power consumption that is shared by these two operations, larger than what it was before. And we have a set of uh, conclusions that uh, you can uh, visit the web, web page of the project and uh, learn more, where the conclusion, again, the takeaway is that you cannot come up uh, with the realistic uh, functions that describe, as we did before, that describe the operation of the base station as function of its inputs. You cannot come up with a realistic uh, relation between the transmission power and the power consumption, for instance, because you have this uh, linear, non-increasing, uh, non-linear relations of, for instance, the decoding time or the different configurations that give a different power consumption get the same throughput. Okay, so you need to learn how to run these uh, devices. Now it's too late in the uh, in the afternoon and you are too tired to go through mathematical modeling, but uh, just to give you a, a very high level view of how we model this as a learning problem. So we model the virtual base station operation as a learning model. We take, and this is fully compliant with the ORAN proposals or the ideas that are uh, circulated in this thread. We take as input the context for downlink and uplink which summarizes what happened in terms of channel conditions and demands of the users in total aggregate uh, numbers in the previous period of, let's say, each period can be a few seconds. Then we decide the, downs the power consumption, the MCS and the maximum airtime that we can allocate to every user, excuse me, at most for the next time period. So essentially, we set the thresholds for this meta policy at the high level of the ORAN architecture, and then your typical scheduler runs with these thresholds. And what you try to achieve is to maximize a, a meaningful function that weights the throughput that you achieve in the downlink and the throughput that you achieve in the uplink by taking into account how much load you have to serve there, Okay, which is pretty much standard. And modeling this as a learning problem, we have the, the throughput, the weighted throughput that we achieve, and then the power consumption. And there is a factor here that determines the priority, the operator or anyone who manages, uh, every, any, any person managing the network wants to give to the one or the other metric. And we try to achieve the uh, minimum regret or sublinear regret. What does this mean? We try without knowing what is the optimal configuration for the next let's say 100 periods, which uh, depends uh, on the uh, demand of the user, the channel conditions, all these things that we don't know. Still, we learn them on the fly and we manage, manage to achieve on average as good performance as that hypothetical policy could have achieved, right? So imagine that you know the future, then you are able to select the single best configuration for your virtual base station for the next day. This is, of course, impossible in practice. What we achieve here is that we provide you with a learning algorithm that learns the channels, the conditions, but also the performance of the machine and uh, approaches with um, guarantees that optimal performance. OK, and there is a twist of this problem where essentially you explore uh, the optimal configurations without at any time uh, using a configuration that goes beyond the power limit that you have set. Again, imagine a power over Ethernet based station. OK, so these are some technical details, but let me say that there is uh, the, the paper is available, the code and the data set for uh, all this series of experiments and papers. You can find them in our uh, websites, in the website of Jose and address. And here are some experiments. Again, I don't want to uh, spend too much time because we don't have any actually that show that indeed we have evaluated this again in using the testbed and using realistic uh, traces of user demands. And we saw that indeed the algorithm manages to follow the demand, adapts to the varying network conditions and uh, identifies the optimal configuration without knowing this uh, future demands. Okay. 
And uh, yeah, the data sets can be found uh, in Jose's, uh, the first author of these works in his uh, web page. Okay. So a twist of this problem, and uh, if you bear with me two minutes, I can describe this very shortly, is when we don't, we are not interested on throughput, but we are interested on the quality criterion of the specific service. And this can be, for instance, the accuracy of the inferences we use, we give to the user. Imagine you have a user who has uh, some visual impairments, visual difficulties, and use this uh, application, for instance, seeing AI from Microsoft, I think there are others as well, which just records, uh, you know, streams the video of the user to a server, and the server identifies using a neural network what are the objects, and gives then the app gives visual, um, sorry, audio guidance to the user who cannot see the objects, describes that, uh, have used actually, the app is very interesting, it tells you, there is a person in front of you, uh, 30 to 40 years old, and uh, is a female and uh, smiles, this kind of information. So this, uh, in this case, it's not enough to give high throughput to that user. You need to give high accuracy of uh, the inferences. And we argue that in the same way, for instance, we tune the video frame, the video quality that we stream to the users, adapting to the, the conditions of the network, for instance, with DAS. In the same way here, we need to have an end-to-end uh, configuration both at the uh, at making decisions both at the user device for instance what are the frame uh, the video frame qualities or the um, uh, the video resolution with which it captures the, its environment but at the network side how we configure the vbs uh, base station and at the edge server how we process this data and then we try to maximize by jointly making all these decisions, the accuracy of the inferences subject to power constraints. And we studied this problem both over Wi-Fi networks and even more interesting is over um, cellular networks, where as I said, let me repeat one more time, we have a server that determines, for instance, what library it will use for, the, uh, for making these inferences, for processing the images. We configure the virtual base station in the same way that we were doing before, but also we'll configure the user device by determining how much to compress the images. Okay, All these decisions affect in a way that you cannot predict the performance. Why you cannot predict? Because as our measurements in this uh, recent paper in Connext show, the result of the accuracy of the power consumption depend on what kind of machine you use for the base station, what are the data, how well is your neural network trained for this data. So it depends on all these factors that you cannot a priori know. Okay, again, we use Bayesian learning techniques that are good, and we have shown this with experiments, to find good in finding uh, what is the optimal configuration of the system. Okay, and there are plenty of results that I could go through, but I will skip this. Just concluding, saying that uh, we're very excited about this work. So there are three, four papers now uh, published about this. It's uh, one of the main, but uh, uh, there are many activities in Demon around these uh, problems. And uh, of course, uh, this is only possible to have these nice results by good teams like uh, these uh, guys here. Thank you very much. Very, very interesting presentation. Um, very interesting results. Uh, we have time if there's a short question in the audience. If not, feel free to ask your questions in the chat and Georgios yeah. can reply to yes. them. Thank you. Thank you for your time and uh, feel free to email me or write in the chat. Thank you. Then we move on to the final presentation of today, uh, also from the Daemon project. Uh, the Reli Reliable Run Virtualization in Shared Platforms by Andres Garcia Saavedra. Yes, hello. Let me share my screen, which hopefully you can see now. Yes. Okay. So, yeah, so this is the second presentation from, from uh, uh, you know, spawning from, from the work that we're doing in Daemon. Uh, similarly to the previous presentation, you know, this is a, a, a very concrete use case on, on technology uh, that is being built in the project. Uh, tomorrow you have a more general view uh, of the whole project with other use cases that we are, of course, uh, working on. And so this one is, is uh, you know, related to how to actually make uh, five GB stations or six GB stations uh, reliable when you actually deploy them in a virtualized environment, right? I will, I will, I will argue that you know that this, this is not an easy problem to solve. 
uh, how the industry is solving this problem uh, currently, why that's not a good approach for the future of, 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 of virtualization uh, of mobile networks, and you know, a potential solution that we are proposing here from the project. So uh, yeah, like I said, virtualizing a 4G, 5G, and probably a 6G based station is hard, right? And as, as you may know, the pipeline of, of physical layer tasks involved in, in the distributed unit of a base station has tight and hard deadlines. And these latency requirements are harder than for classical network functions. Now, in this case, violating deadlines imply that users lose synchronization with the base station and network the throughput to collapse completely. And for this reason, the industry today relies heavily on overdimensioning the computing capacity of the virtualized infrastructure that they devote, you know, to deploy these, these virtualized base stations. And they do this by essentially offloading the most compute intensive tasks, typically for water error correction coding, to dedicated hardware accelerators that can then perform these tasks uh, very fast. Here at the bottom, I put two examples uh, that uh, probably some of you uh, are aware of. Intel Flexran is a solution that is that relies on FPGAs, or NVIDIA Arial is a solution that relies on GPUs to 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 do forward error correction uh, tasks very fast for commercial virtualized base stations in the industry today. Right. So uh, what I want to argue here is uh, using this type of hardware dedicated hardware accelerators is expensive. And these are actually two statements from top executives in the industry, acknowledging that this approach renders base stations that are more expensive and energy consuming than the classical base stations based on hardwired ASICs, basically. So the point I want to make here is that we need to find solutions that attain the advantages of virtualization without the costs of dedicated hardware accelerators. And the solution is obviously sharing computing resources. And this is in line with activities that the Oran Alliance is, 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 is doing now. So in this way, we can exploit the computing performance of hardware accelerators at an affordable cost per base station because the cost in this case is also shared, right? Now, while this is a very appealing solution for the future of virtualized runs, there is an important challenge. Sharing implies non-deterministic computing performance and jitter, which means that meeting latency constraints cannot be guaranteed 100%. And this is a rel reliability hazard uh, for virtualizing uh, cellular base stations. And this is the core of the problem that we are trying to uh, look into in Demon. So let's analyze in more detail uh, 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 the root of this problem. Now, how a distributed unit works. So every one millisecond, a distributed unit receives OFDM symbols from the radio unit encoding one uplink subframe, right? Uh, this application subframe carries control and data channels, including all the data transport blocks, uh, uh, data from the users, and control feedback that are sent by the users in the uplink direction. Processing these channels, each of these channels consists of additional pipelines performing uh, tasks such as the modulation of OFDM symbols or forward error correction coding, decoding in this case because we're in the uplink direction, uh, which are heavy in terms of computation if, if, if you run this in, 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 in software. The point now is that only once all these channels are processed, can we then make scheduling decisions, and not before, because the uplink data and control channels carry information that is needed to calculate scheduling grants, uh, for example, feedback from the users about the buffer states or, or the quality of their downlink channel. So information that is needed to actually schedule uh, uh, data in the uh, upcoming uh, subframes. And only once all the scheduling grants are calculated, both for, both for uplink and downlink, obviously, then we can process a downlink subframe that includes the corresponding data and control channels and other important signals that preserve synchronization with the users, right? And synchronization with the users is, is here a, a key metric that we want to preserve at all costs. So 3GPP imposes latency constraints between uplink and downlink channels. For instance, in LTE, users expect feedback of the uh, hy hybrid IQ process in exactly three milliseconds. In 5G, this constraint can be configured, but it is usually three milliseconds to or lower. And the key thing here is that this latency constraint implies a hard deadline to process uh, all this pipeline of tasks, essentially what we call a job, right? So to summarize, every one millisecond, we have a pipeline of tasks that we have to be executed uh, uh, in a sequence and in less than three milliseconds to guarantee uh, synchronization with the users to guarantee reliability. So 
if we are using shared computer plat platforms, as we mentioned at the beginning, is something that we should do, uh, we do not have deterministic computing latency anymore. So it may well happen that some tasks, especially those more compute intensive that involve processing data channels, both in the uplink and downlink direction, uh, which are indicated here in, in with red uh, rectangles, may occasionally take longer than expected and cause that the whole job, the whole pipeline, violate its deadline, as illustrated here in this in this in this figure. And as a result, a downlink subframe containing important control and synchronization signals cannot be delivered to the users when they expect it, and therefore they lose synchronization with the base station and network throughput collapses. Now, to illustrate how relevant this problem is. We actually ran a, a toy experiment with two distributed units sharing a small computer. Uh, importantly here, we have performed all of our experiments with full-fledged 3 vb Complay and base stations provided by SRS Run, which, uh, as you may know, an open source implementation of a complete uh, base station stack. Uh, here we have two DUs, two base stations. One DU, D1, exchanges as much traffic as possible with an UE, and the y-axis of the plot shows is application layer throughput performance. Now for the second DU, DU2, we gradually increase its load as indicated by the x-axis of the plot. And as you can see from the yellow curve, at some point, the computing interference generated by the second DU is high enough to cause DU1 to miss computing deadlines, which you know cause the UE to lose synchronization, as I mentioned before, and for the, th the throughput go, of the base station go to zero. So this is an important problem that we need to tackle. And this is a solution that we call Nuveru uh, that we have developed with, uh, within the context of the project that essentially addresses this precise problem. And we, when we run exactly the same experiment with uh, Nuveru, which is a redesign of the view pipeline from before, uh, we actually uh, see that we are able to preserve maximum throughput, uh, mainly because we can actually preserve synchronization with the users and handle their data uh, as best as we can, given the computing fluctuations that we have from the interference of, of the U2. Now, how do we do this? So this uh, here at the bottom, you can see a simple illustration of, of, of Nuveru, right? which is the solution that we are proposing, uh, in contrast to the baseline approach, which is uh, essentially a pipeline of tasks in, in a sequence. The, under, the underlying idea is, is extremely simple. So every job, so every millisecond, the goal is to make sure that the most important signals and channels those that preserve user synchronization can always uh, be processed before the final deadline, which is the red, de the, the red de deadline here in the figure. So in this way, the goal is that by this red deadline, Nuveru always has ready the minimum amount of information required to build a viable downlink subframe, which we call minimum viable subframe. And uh, this is a, a subframe that actually can preserve synchronization with the users even if to do so, we have to sacrifice data channels somehow, which it may happen because we have computing fluctuations. So to this end, we set up hard deadline, which is depicted here in blue in, in, the, in the middle of, of the pipeline at the, at the bottom, uh, for uplink, and, uh, uh, for uplink and, and downlink data channels to be processed. So we make sure that we always have enough residual time for those other critical tasks that enable this minimum viable suffering that I mentioned before to make sure that we preserve synchronization with the users at all costs, despite the competing fluctuations that, that we may have in this in this shared platform. Now, in a way, this idea is, is obvious, right? So we want to protect the, the most important signals. However, for this to work, both uplink and downlink data processing tasks need to be decoupled from the rest of the task in the pipeline. And this is not easy. This is actually a, a more, uh, accurate description of what's really going on in a DU pipeline. I'm not going to get into, into details, but just note the blue arrows that we have uh, connecting blocks here. These represent dependencies between the tasks. So all these dependencies depend us, uh, so prevent us to decouple data processing tasks from this other critical task, which is really what we want to do. Now, now the, the important thing to do here is to break these dependencies somehow. And as we will explain uh, later, what we do is essentially we rely on predictions at different layers of this, of this pipeline. So we achieve this with three techniques. So the first one is a uh, two-stage uh, downlink scheduling approach instead of the regular uh, scheduling approach that we do at once. Here, as soon as a job begins, so uh, every one millisecond, we generate downlink scheduling grants proactively without awaiting feedback from the users, which is carried 
by applying channels that have not yet been processed by this pipeline. That is, we make a prediction on the channel quality of the downlink link based on past feedback from the users, and we issue downlink grants accordingly. This actually allows us to begin processing downlink transport blocks, so performing forward error correction coding on those blocks, which is heavy in terms of computing, without having to wait for the uplink channels to be processed. So we uh, give this, this, this process a bit more uh, computing time to do, the, to do its job. Then in the second stage, which is at the right, uh, after the blue deadline, only those grants processed on time are included for this job. Now, two events may happen. One, that processing a downlink grant finishes before the blue deadline. And in this case, the second stage of the schedule will map the grant into the resource grid as usual. Or that processing a grant is not finished before the deadline. And in such case, what we do is we store those grants for future jobs. That is, what we do is essentially we delay the delivery of data to the users temporarily to make sure that they at least receive control and synchronization signals, which, as I mentioned, are uh, critical to preserve synchronization. So the second approach is early HARC. Uh, uh, so essentially, once we receive an public subframe, we start processing the data transport blocks therein. Now, like before, two events may happen. One, that the work gets done before the blue deadline. And in this case, what we do is the whole pipeline continues as expected, as a normal base station, using the feedback and information provided in those uplink channels that are by the, by the second stage of this pipeline already completely processed. Or two, that the work does not finish before the blue deadline. And in this case, what we do essentially, we make a prediction about the decodability of this data, right? Uh, uh, that could not be decoded in time. And continue the rest of the pipeline relying upon these predictions instead of on the real thing. I, I, I of course, I don't have time to present the details of, of the predictor that we use, but uh, I, I imagine to actually read uh, the paper. I, give, I will give you a reference later if you're interested in this on how we do this prediction. So the last technique is congestion control, which actually consists in a very simple feedback loop inspired by TCP uh, that regulates, regulates the size of the uplink and downlink grants depending on whether transport blocks are encoded, sorry, are encoded or decoded in time or not. Now, if they are processed in time, the congestion window grows additively. Otherwise, the congestion window shrinks. Now, this allows us to regulate the demand for computing resources to the actual capacity of the platform in terms of computation, right? Um, so I will just add that uh, how much we grow as in this congestion window, how big these uh, radio grants are, is dictated by a parameter, which we call here lambda, uh, which roughly speaking sets the aggressivity of this approach and establishes a point in, in, in the throughput versus uh, delay trade of that, that we are establishing here. So uh, we, of course, evaluated our approach. Uh, and to this, as I mentioned at the beginning, we actually integrated, we implemented this approach into a full-fledged 3 EPP compliant base station stack. Uh, what we did essentially, we modified the physical layer and Mac layers of SRS RAM, which is an open source implementation of these stacks. And I only have time here to briefly show a couple of results. But again, uh, take a look at the paper that I will give you the reference of uh, later uh, if, if you're interested to see a more thorough evaluation. So in this first result, what we do, what we did is we deployed the baseline approach or Nuveru in a platform, along with a different number of competing base stations or DUs sharing the same computing platform at full load, right? Now these plots, so at the left, the uplink throughput, and at the right, the downlink throughput of the, of the distributed unit of the base station that we are testing, either Nuveru or the baseline, as a function of the number of competing base stations or DUs that are in the system at full load. So the baseline approach is depicted in yellow with yellow bars, and Nuveru with different configurations is depicted in with bluish and, and greenish color bars. bars. So the main message here is that, as expected, the performance of the baseline approach collapses as soon as we have competition from, for computing resources. We saw it. We saw that already in, the, in, the, in, in a previous results, right? Now, in mark contrast, Nuveru can sustain high performance irrespective, irrespective of the number of competing videos. And only when we disable one of our mechanisms, early hard, which is depicted in green, and, and uh, we actually see uh, some compromise in terms of uplink performance. 
right? Which gradually decreases linearly uh, with the number of competing views. So I think uh, we believe this is uh, a uh, huge improvement in terms of performance of in this type of systems. So the last result uh, is about the cost. That, uh, so, so what we're paying for this uh, increase in reliability, right? This reliability comes at a cost, right? Um, so here, uh, we only have one DU, one base station with Nuberu or the baseline approach. And what we did is we artificially slowed down the speed of the CPU professor as we move in the x-axis of the plot. So at the left-hand side of the plot, uh, of the x-axis, we have the highest possible speed of the, CPU uh, of the CPU processor, and we slow it down gradually towards we move in the right direction. So in the left plot, we saw the throughput performance of the DU, and as expected, the baseline suddenly collapses, giving enough CPU speed reduction, and in contrast, Nuberu can preserve maximum performance, maximum throughput, uh, using the most aggressive settings of, of Lambda, uh, which is depicted in green. Um, however, this high throughput with the green line comes at a cost in terms of data delivery delay, which is indicated in the right plot. So all in all, what we do is we guarantee reliability 100%, right? But we have a trade-off between throughput and delay that we can optimize by parameterizing uh, Nuveru accordingly. So uh, this is all I wanted to uh, talk about today about this uh, one result from, from the project. Uh, so this is essentially a paper that uh, uh, we have recently uh, published at Mobicon 2022. So you can check out the details in this paper if you're interested. We have a data set that is publicly available in this address. Uh, if you're interested, send me an email and I will send the link to you. We have a plant. A demonstrator uh, at UCNC 2022. This will be a live in person demonstrator. So please come by, uh, check the demonstrator, and make all the questions you have. And again, this is just one of many technologies and demonstrators that we are doing, implementing, and planning from the demon perspective. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Very interesting presentation. Uh, are there any questions from the audience? There is one question on the availability of the recordings, and uh, so uh, it uh, most likely will appear on the Hexalix website. Thank you, Miko. If there are no questions, um, I would like to thank all the uh, speakers today, in both sessions, and uh, for all the audience. And we continue the uh, workshop tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Uh, CET. So thank you all, and if Miko, you have any final words? Yeah, so uh, no, no also other essential things except uh, uh, thank you. So lots of uh, really good uh, presentations uh, today and uh, quite uh, quite active uh, interaction in the, in the chat as uh, well. So uh, looking forward to having more interaction between our projects uh, and uh, uh, having uh, uh, also active uh, interactions outside of Europe. Question on the slides, Miko, maybe you can. Same, same applies uh, that uh, depends on the presenters. Uh, so those uh, who allow the slides to be said, they would be available on our website. Okay, then we are 